You know it's this. Take a perk and talk it and see. Money swallowing like six. Did it perfect to the kid. Got a million on my head. I'm a bit better put on a rope. I just win. I don't want to get a million dollars. The devil that's it in a chip with a key. Hello and welcome back, fellow anime lovers, to Manga Muse. I am delighted to have you join us once again in the world of fanfiction and fantasy. This is the 11th part of What If Deku Finds Ben's Watch Ultimatrix. Special note, this fanfic is written in a masterpiece of the incredible Muffin on fanfiction.net. Do check and support the author too. Now smash the like, share and subscribe button for more. Also press the bell icon so that you never miss such great parts. Thanks for the introduction. Now let's dive into the world. The music starts, and the scene opens from Midoriya's point of view, staring down at the visor in his hands. He then raises it to his face, and the perspective changes to see him in front of his class, all of them in costume, staring off into the distance. As the music becomes more upbeat, Class 1A charges, but Midoriya hesitates when he sees Holo Ben in front of him. The hologram grins, but then vanishes, Midoriya shakes his head, and then follows after his class as he turns into Diamond Head. Explosions herald the next scene, and Bakugo is standing on top of a pile of debris, laughing at the destruction he caused. Behind him, Kirishima and Kaminari look exasperated. Above them, Yuraraka flies to avoid a kick from a blonde girl in a black bodysuit. She draws her metal arm back, and the brainiac symbol on her shoulder glows through the fabric of her costume. The light covers everything, and when it fades, we see all for one in his cell, smiling as a silhouette grows around him. The scene shifts to Midoriya, Asui and Todoroki as they face down Gang Orca. In the background, Ida rockets away from a massive tornado. Yeirazu's arms glow with her quirk as she prepares to battle a large group of shadowy figures, and Ashido and Siro dodge falling debris. As the music comes to an end, Midoriya sits down on a rock and looks at the Omnitrix. The dial starts to turn, and then everything cuts to black. The night before the provisional license exam should have seen class 1 a turn in early, but the students were all either too nervous or too excited to sleep just yet. Most of them milled around the lounge, or did some light exercise outside. The rising stars decided on the former. Do you think Aizawa sensei was overselling how hard the test was gonna be? Ashido asked nervously. Maybe it was one of his logical deceptions. Somehow, I doubt it, Yeyurazu sighed. He probably expected us to expect that, and decided to tell the honest truth. Todoroki, who was sitting next to Ashido on a sofa, shrugged. Unless he was expecting us to expect that, so he expected to. Stop. Ashido hugged her boyfriend and buried her face in the crook of his neck, uncaring that one of her horns was poking his cheek. If you guys say any more, my head's gonna explode. Siro laughed, and considering where she is, dude, that'd be a big mess on you. Despite having her eyes closed, Ashido managed to kick his shin. Gross. Thanks for that mental image. Yuraraka's own laugh turned into a yawn. Hey, Deku-kun, any idea what kind of quirks people from other schools might use on us? With his girlfriend tucked into his side and her head on his shoulder, Midoriya couldn't give her the dry look that question deserved. Only Yue has a sports festival, and nobody advertises their students' quirks like that. Right? Dumb question. Ida hummed thoughtfully. What about numbers? Midoriya took a moment to rest his cheek against the top of Yuraraka's head as he thought about it. Going by the average dropout rate in hero classes between first and second years, the number of schools that have hero courses, and stats of last year's number of provisional license holders. I think at least 500 students will be participating. A thousand is the average, maybe a few hundred more if it's a big year. His friends all stared at him. You just have all those statistics in your head? Siro asked. Why yes? When the staring continued, Midoriya leaned behind Yuraraka to hide. He's the world's biggest hero otaku, Asui said. We should have expected this, Ribbit. Midoriya whimpered, and his friends laughed. Yeyurazu ran her fingers through her hair, which she'd gotten into the habit of letting down in front of others when not in class or costume, as she thought. Achako, you asked if Izuku knew what quirks would be used against us. Do you really think that the exam will involve combat? Yuraraka shrugged. With our luck, probably. Great, Siro said with heavy sarcasm. We're gonna go up against students who are way more experienced than us. But that is because our teachers believe that we can succeed. Ida made to chop at the air, but he realized that his arm only had one place to go. Yay, Yurazu's head, so he refrained. Even if we do not pass, we should be honored that we were even considered. Then we have to pass, Todoroki mused. I don't want to break that trust. Besides, I failed the last big test we had, and I refuse to fail again. I feel the same, Ribbit. Asui leaned back in her chair. If we don't pass, it'll feel like we wasted all that training. 
it will still be wasted if we're all too tired to perform well tomorrow, Yeyurazu said as she stood up. Come on, everyone go to bed. Ashido groaned. Yes, mom. Still, she didn't move until Todoroki slid a piece of ice down the back of her shirt. Hey, not cool. Todoroki smirked and stole a kiss from her. I'd say it was. The other rising stars stared at him as he walked off. Did he or Araka slowly blinked? Did he just make a pun? I can't. Siro dramatically put his head on Asui's shoulder. I just can't. Shigaraki wasn't happy. Then again, he wasn't happy most days. He was usually angry, bitter, or brooding. Today, however, he was particularly unhappy, and he only had himself to blame. Technically, he could have blamed Nine. And a few months ago, he absolutely would have blamed anyone but himself. But he knew that this was entirely his fault. You know, most people prove themselves worthy of being second in command. He said, careful to keep his tone idle. They don't demand it. Nine sat across from him in the abandoned motel the league was using as a temporary base. It's simple logic. You need a right hand, and a successor if the worst should happen. I don't plan on the worst happening. I'm sure all for one thought the same thing, and look what happened to him. Shigaraki's only sign of anger was a slight tightness around his eyes. And why do you want to be my second, and not at the top? Nine's face was mostly hidden by his mask, but it was obvious that he was smiling. Because all for one named you his successor. For now, I will give you the benefit of the doubt and assume that you are worthy. If you prove incapable, I will step in and assume leadership and you'll have an easier time if you're already right below the top. Shigaraki fumed silently until a thought occurred to him. Fine, but I have a condition. Nine merely gestured for him to continue. Unless I actually screw up so badly that the League is in jeopardy, you follow every one of my orders. If you even think that someone in the League is plotting against me, you let me know. Until such time as I no longer deserve it, your loyalty to me will be absolute. Nine considered that for a moment. Very well. But if someone is moving against you, why shouldn't I simply eliminate them immediately? Shigaraki snorted. Because most of the people in the league aren't stupid, crazy, yeah, but not stupid. No one will move against me unless they've got support, either from within the league or a rival from outside. I want to know just how far back a plot goes before I tear it out. He rested his cheek on his fist. Did I pass your test? Your answer was sufficient. Nine mirrored the younger man. I will follow you until you no longer deserve to be followed. At least you didn't drop this stupid test when everyone was in the room. In case you were wondering, I hadn't planned for everyone to be gone. I simply took advantage of their absence today. Nine paused. I am aware that everyone had errands to run for you, except Toga, yet she isn't here. Why is that? Shigaraki chuckled. I sent her on a special mission. I asked her to retrieve a few things for me. If she succeeds, it'll make ruling this country a lot easier. Nine raised an eyebrow. And what exactly will she be retrieving? Let's just say that all for one left me with a few of his plans. I've modified them for my own purposes. All you or anyone else needs to know is that, if we succeed, all who are loyal to me will have a place at the table. Well, that's intriguing. Nine rose and bowed. It was shallow and slightly mocking, but Shigaraki could tell that there was a little respect as well. I suppose I'll have to stay loyal for now, if only to see where this path leads. Midoriya had just gotten used to not wearing his tie so often, and now he was adjusting it nervously as the bus pulled up to the massive arena-like structure being used for the tests. It was impossible to see what awaited them, but it wasn't hard to imagine that it would involve moving around. If Class 1 a thought they would have 1B joined them, they were mistaken, the other bus kept driving, while they got out. I guess they're separating us, Ashido said as she grabbed her costume case. When are we gonna actually hang out with those guys? It's like Yue is trying to make sure we don't get along. You want to spend time with Monoma? Yeyorazu asked incredulously. Well, no, not him, but the rest of the class seems okay. Ashido spotted Minda creeping closer to them. He was a few steps away from being able to look up the girl's skirts when Sato wordlessly hauled him off. Do you think Class B would trade someone for him? I wouldn't subject anyone to that little rat, not even Monoma. Before Yeyurazu could launch into a proper tirade about Mainta, Aizawa shuffled over to his class. All right, listen up. This exam will be harder than anything you've done in class. You may have to deal with situations you'd only ever see as a pro. And your only saving grace will be that it'll be in a controlled setting. Treat this like you would a life or death scenario. Remember everything you've learned, and you'll do well. Aizawa sensei is right. Ida shouted. If we are to succeed, we must go beyond. Plus, Ultra, everyone jumped when a boy who definitely wasn't from UA suddenly shouted from behind them. He was huge, easily as tall as Shoji, and almost as muscular as Sato. His school uniform was similar to theirs, 
but with a distinctive hat that most of them immediately recognized. Shaikh Suhai was UAS rival school. Their respective success was so close that some people honestly couldn't tell which was the best at any given year. Sorry about that. The boy yelled, a huge smile on his face. I just got so excited when I saw UA students here, and then you were about to shout your motto, and I couldn't help but join in. Before any of the UA students could reply, more Shaikhsu students showed up and started shoving the boy away. Sorry about that, one grunted as they moved on. He gets excited. As he was being pushed, the boy passed by Todoroki. His smile vanished and he gave the shorter student a piercing stare. Todoroki met it stoically. But if the Shaikhsu student found something in his gaze, it satisfied him, and he continued on without further resistance. Midoriya didn't notice the staring. He was too busy meeting the gaze of a beautiful girl with long blonde hair. She licked her lips and winked at him, something about that sent a shiver down his spine, and not the pleasant kind. Iroraka, who had seen that, glared at the taller girl with such intensity that the blonde actually noticed the killing intent. Rather than flinch or seem worried, she gave Iroraka a wink as well, and then skipped away. I don't know her, and I don't like her, Yuraka growled. What just happened? Siro asked. Who was the crazy dude? Aizawa sighed. All the excitement seemed to drain what little energy he had left. That was Yurashi in Asao. He's a first-year student from Shaikhsu, and held the top assessment score for recommendations. He withdrew after that test and transferred to Shaikhsu, though. Oh, I remember him now. Yeyurazu looked worried. He even outdid Shoto. That worried more than a few students, Todoroki was seen as one of the most powerful students in UA, so knowing that Yurashi had surpassed him was alarming. One thing that confused them was that he had withdrawn from UA. Sure, Shaikhsu was good, but if he liked UA so much, why leave? Huh? Todoroki crossed his arms and looked down. I don't remember him at all. I guess he didn't leave an impression. Just as everyone thought the pre-test excitement was over, another bus pulled up, before it came to a complete stop. A woman in a gaudy orange and green costume hopped out and waved. Hey, eraser. Whoever she was, those two words were enough to make Aizawa flinch in genuine fear. That was such an unusual reaction that even Bakugo paid attention. Hurry up, Aizawa hissed to the class. Get inside, let's go. Oh, come on, eraser, it's been too long. The woman grinned and playfully elbowed him. Let's get married. Not on your life. TFFF. The woman cackled. Oh, you're hilarious. You just know that our lives would be filled with laughter if we got married. No, your life would be filled with laughter. My life would be filled with the cyanide I'd put in my dinner. Aizawa's words were so deadpan that no one was completely sure he wasn't serious. Midoriya had been trying to identify the woman from her costume for a while now and finally figured it out. Oh, that's Ms. Joke, the smile hero. Her quirk is called Outburst, and it can cause people to laugh so hard that they can't even move. Ms. Joke grinned at him. Yep, is one of your students a fan of me, Eraser? He's a fan of all heroes, don't get a swelled head. I'll take it, just like I know you'll take me out to dinner tonight. I would rather do literally anything else. Hey, kids. Ms. Joke ignored his griping and waved at the bus. Come over here and meet some UA students. A few students stepped out of the bus. Midoriya didn't know if Ms. Joke's class was small because others had dropped out or these were the only ones she'd decided would take the exam. One of them caught 1A's attention by virtue of looking like an older version of Midoriya. The resemblance was so uncanny that even the stranger's classmates did a double take. Hey there, the boy said with a grin. I'm Shindo Yo, we're from Ketsubutsu Academy. Nice to meet you. Midoriya's eyes went wide. Ketsubutsu wasn't as prestigious as Yue or Shaikatsu, but it turned out its fair share of successful heroes. He recalled that Hawk's sidekick, Takeda, had been a Ketsubatsu student. The school had also been his backup choice if Yue hadn't accepted him, if he had gone there instead. It would have been weird going to school with someone who looked like he could have been his older brother. Shindo held out his hand to Midoriya to shake. He was about to take it, but Bakugo stormed up. For some reason, Ashido also pulled Midoriya back at the same time. Don't give us that friendly act, Bakugo snarled. I can see the calculating look in your eye a mile away. If you're here to mess around, do it during the test so I can blow you to hell. A girl with short blonde hair elbowed Shindo. Looks like you were found out, yo. Shindo smirked, and the friendly aspect was gone. Yes so. See you guys inside. Bye, eraser. Ms. Joke waved as she guided her students away. See you later. Preferably never, Aizawa said, and directed his own students towards the entrance. Come on, before something else happens. You're an idiot, Deku. Bakugo growled as they walked. Not everyone's gonna fall over themselves to be your friend. You should have seen how that asshole was gunning for you. Er, before Midoriya could reply, Bakugo stormed ahead. Instead, he turned to Ashido. Thanks, I guess. No problem. 
Ashido kept a firm grip on his shoulder. Bakugo is an ass, but he made a good point. That Ketsubutsu guy's smile really rubbed me the wrong way. Siro nodded. Yeah, for all we know, he was gonna use his quirk on you to sabotage you from the get-go. Ashido twitched. Okay, I didn't think about that. I just didn't want some creep getting near my twin. Yet you didn't do anything when that other girl was eyeing Izuku, Ribbit, Asui said. Are you kidding? Achako was ready to tear her a new one. I'm surprised she hasn't come after us if she gets this jealous. Iroraka smiled. It was sweet, but the other girls felt distinctly uneasy. Don't worry, if it comes down to it, I'll make your deaths quick and painless. The girls of Class 1A collectively made a note to not risk finding out if she was kidding. Midoriya stepped out of the locker room set aside for the UA students. He was now in his costume and felt ready for whatever the exam threw his way. He shared a brief nod with the other boys and joined the girls on the way to the assembly room. He and Yuraraka hadn't been the only ones to change their costumes leading up to the exam. Hiroshima now had long sleeves attached to his shoulder guards. Kaminari had a visor on his face, along with what looked like some kind of ballistic weapon on his arm, and Gyro had added small speakers to the backs of her hands. Sui had an entirely new outfit, made of nanotech like Hagakure. It reacted to her skin changing pigment, so it would become camouflaged like her. She had also added black spots to her back, and added a protective headpiece that looks like an angular baseball cap. Yeyurazu had also decided to change up her look by programming her costume to have a black stripe running up the sides. Midoriya had never seen any of his classmates' costumes as too outlandish, and when he saw some of the costumes from other schools, he thought his outfit was downright boring. Some of the costumes he saw looked more appropriate as sports mascots. More than just the variety, he was also intimidated by just how many people were here. There had to be over a thousand. All right, everyone settle down. There was a pause as the speakers rang with feedback, and the tired-looking man on the podium on the far end of the room winced. Really need to get that fixed. Anyway, I'm Mary Yokimaru, I'm from the Hero Public Safety Commission, and I'll be overseeing this test. Oh, God, I'm exhausted, we put in so much time for a one-day test, and my sleep schedule is shot to hell. Is this guy okay? Yuraka asked worriedly. He makes Aizawa sensei sound happy. Moving on. You might be surprised by the number of you trying to get provisional licenses. That's because we've actively encouraged schools to send any and all students here to try out. With All Might retired, criminal analysts have predicted that villain-related incidents will skyrocket. You might think that we could counter that by flooding the streets with heroes, but you'd be wrong god, I need a cup of coffee. Mira paused and rested his head against the stand for a moment. Okay, 10 second nap is over. As for that assumption, you'd be wrong. All Might was able to lower crime all by himself, so we're going to get as many of the best into the field as we can. In previous years, this exam had about a 50% pass rate. This year, we're only taking the top 100. That's right, out of over 1,500, only 100 will pass today. More than a few of the 1,500 students present gasped. Suddenly, this exam looked a lot more intimidating. As for the content of exam, I'll start by saying that it's a free-for-all. Mara nodded at the small group of men in suits, who moved out and handed each student three silver discs and six orange balls. You'll attach the discs anywhere you want on your bodies, as long as they're not hidden, no armpits, no feet, or anywhere else that isn't easily visible. Your goal will be to tag the targets with the balls. If all three of your targets are hit, you're immediately eliminated. Oh, and you have to eliminate two other students to secure a spot, and only the person who tags the third target will actually get credit. Midoriya was given his targets, and after a moment to consider, he placed them in a line going up his left arm. If he was going to be a pro hero, people would know that he used the watch as part of his quirk, though they wouldn't know the whole truth. Either way, he'd have to get used to defending his left arm. One last thing, Mira said. We'll give you a few minutes to get situated once we open up. Before anyone could wonder what that meant, the room shook and the walls split apart. They were now in the middle of the arena, which reminded Midoriya of the USJ. It was filled with samples of different terrain, from urban to industrial to open water. Some of you may favor certain environments. We'll give you time to find your favorite spot. Good luck. What should we do, Deku? Yuraka asked. Midoriya wondered why she didn't use her usual suffix, until he realized that she was using his hero name. We should stick together, Deku said. The other schools had already broken away, leaving one in an open, rocky area. I wouldn't be surprised if other classes went after us first. We're first years, and they probably saw what we can do from the sports festival. Our best chance is to weather an all-out attack, then counter one group at a time. Screw that. Ground Zero shouted and stomped off. 
You wanna play it safe and wait for these shits to come after you, be my guest. I'm gonna find some punks to kill and be the first one to pass. Before Deku could protest, Chargebolt and Red Riot chased after Ground Zero, leaving the class at 17. Don't worry, Genesis said calmly. The rest of us are more than capable of passing. Just stick together and we'll be fine. You heard the class president. Alien Queen did some light stretching as she waited. We've got this. Then the bell rang, and all hell broke loose. When she wasn't trying some ridiculous prank or flirting with him, Aizawa would, begrudgingly, and only to himself, admit that Ms. Joke wasn't terrible company. She even made sure to stay out of his personal space by sitting several feet away. So, did you tell your students? She asked. Tell them what? Leave the jokes to me. Eraser, you're only cute, not funny. Ms. Joke was focused on the test below, and thus missed the way Aizawa's eye twitched. I'm guessing you didn't tell your class about this exam's little tradition. What? That everyone always takes UA out first. Or that it's so blindingly one-sided that UA students have to take a makeup exam so that the proctors can actually see if they're worth getting a provisional license. Yes. No, I didn't. Aizawa crossed his arms and leaned back, his head dipped into his scarf, carefully hiding his smug smile. These students might be first years, but they've handled things that would throw off some pros. They're used to unwelcome surprises, if anything. I almost feel sorry for whoever decided to piss them off. Deku didn't recognize the first wave of students who tried to ambush them, and half of them didn't even use their quirks. The powers that did get used were fairly direct. One propelled a ball on a jet of water, and another surrounded two more in a blue aura to remotely fly them at Class 1A. There were others, but all it did was send a few dozen balls at the class. Triumph, alien queen, block our flanks. He snapped out, even as he turned into water hazard. Everyone else, support or avoid as needed. Triumph created a wall of ice to cover their right side, while alien queen melted the balls on the left. With tentacle calling out strays that made it past, it was easy for cellophane and grape juice to create a sticky web to catch them. Genesis created a handful of smoke grenades to block their attacker's view, but between tentacle and earphone jack, Class 1A had a good idea of where they were. More importantly, Water Hazard was able to soak a large group, with a long trail of water connecting him to them on the ground. He then turned into Brainstorm and fired a sustained bolt of electricity into the water. He was rewarded with several screams of pain. Those who are unsuited to large-scale melees should tag those reprobates, Brainstorm said. The sooner you are safe, the sooner you can pass to the next stage of the examination. Troppy used her tongue to catch a ball that slipped the net. You think there's going to be another stage, Ribbit? Undeniably, it would be absurd for all of this to be set up for what amounts to an overcomplicated game of dodgeball. He's right, Genesis said. And those students he took down are going to get tagged by someone else soon. Who thinks they need the win first? First of all, what the hell? Ms. Joke stared at Aizawa, then back at the small tablet she'd been given to observe the test. Second of all, are they actually offering a win to their weaker classmates? It's actually quite logical, Aizawa said. None of them are the type to abandon someone, but they can't fight at their best if they're protecting classmates whose quirks aren't suited for combat. The sooner they're safe, the sooner the rest of them can cut loose. That's actually not a terrible idea. Of course it's not. I taught them, after all. Ms. Joke continued to stare at him. Did you just make a joke? Never. Oh my god, you did. She pulled out her phone. I'm telling everyone. Aizawa tried to grab the phone, but she held it out of reach. Don't. What will you give me? Aizawa closed his eyes and waited for the inevitable. What do you want? When he opened them again, Ms. Joke was smiling, not in an attempt to make him laugh, but in genuine delight. One date, she said. We go out on one real date, like normal people. I know you're not the type of guy to lie to yourself, so if you honestly, honestly, don't enjoy yourself, I'll never ask again. He should have seen that coming. She'd been trying to get him to date her for years. He'd always found an excuse, or, failing that, flat out refused. This time, though, he was cornered, unless he was willing to sacrifice his dignity. Aizawa was silent for a moment, and turned to watch the exam. He nodded to himself as Triumph cleared a path to the students Deku had downed. Fine, he said. Next Saturday, no earlier than seven. You pick the place, as long as it's not too high profile. Ms. Joke nodded so fast that her bright green hair fanned out in all directions. Got it. Thanks, Shoda. Please just focus for today, he said. What the hell? Mira shouted over the intercom. Someone just eliminated over a hundred students in a single shot. Who is this Shikesu kid, and why is he so powerful? Holy crap, I'm actually awake. Even Ms. Joke was startled out of her excitement. She and Aizawa had been to plenty of these tests before, but no one had ever pulled a move like that. 
At least it wasn't anywhere near my kids, both heroes thought to themselves. In the end, there were only enough points to pass Invisible Girl and Anima. The former's invisibility was ruined because her sensors and container of balls didn't disappear with her, and the latter refused to endanger animals with so many quirks flying around. It had been difficult getting them to their targets, even with Triumph covering them with walls of ice, at least until Deku turned into Armadrillo and made an earthquake strong enough to throw their attackers off balance. Deku was glad that his own sensors didn't disappear when he transformed. He was positive that that would have disqualified him. We need to get out of here, he said as he turned into Diamond Head. We're still in the open, and we're surrounded. Triumph, clear a path into the industrial or urban settings. We can fight with our backs to a wall. Triumph only nodded, and drove back a small crowd of students with a torrent of fire. Diamond had formed large plates of crystals to cover their retreat. A moment later, Dark Shadow was at his side, occasionally pulling back to energize himself with the shade from a slab of metal, created by Genesis and held up by Sugarman. We have a similar problem, Genesis said as they moved down a street. There are a lot of us, and any fight could leave us with little room to maneuver. I suggest we split up. Diamond Head didn't like the idea, but he knew she was right, their best defense was also a weakness. Okay, group up, no more than five per team. He was unsurprised when Uravity was the first at his side. They were joined by Cellophane, Froppy, and Tsukayomi. Good luck, guys. Alien Queen said as she, Triumph, Twinkling Knight, Virtus and Grape Juice broke away. Be careful, Genesis cautioned as she led Earphone Jack, Tentacle, Sugarman and Tailman down another alley. Maybe we should stay on this street, Cellophane said. There's room for me, Froppy and Uravity to maneuver, and Deku can use his bigger forms. Good idea, Deku said, though he only turned into Eye Guy. Froppy, go stealth, you're our surprise backup. Got it, Ribbit. Froppy concentrated, and then seemed to blend in with her surroundings. Her sensors were still visible, but her bag was concealed by her long hair, making her difficult to see. Unfortunately, a pair of eyes was already on them. Hey, how come you didn't go after the UA kids, yo? Shindo smirked at Nagakame Tatami his blonde-haired classmate and girlfriend. We both studied that Midoriya kid from the sports festival. I figured I could hit him with my quirk so that we could knock him out of the fight first, but then I saw how he transformed. Before, he had to mess with his watch, but he didn't even touch it this time. Yeah, that makes sense. Nakagame peered out over the cover her class was using. You said that his armadillo form could cancel out your tremors, right? Yep, I thought if I could get him before he turned into that one, I'd be golden. But if he can transform instantly, yeah, I think we should find easier targets. Nakagame pointed to a small crowd of students from another school, who seemed less concerned about their surroundings, and more that they'd missed out on taking down UA. How about those guys? Shindo grinned. That'll work. Better hurry up, everyone, Mira called out. We now have 20 people who have passed. That small window is most vexing, Tsukayomi commented. We must hurry, but we also cannot act with haste. A few of I guy's eyes looked up at a nearby office building. Iravity, get some air, I don't see anyone by the windows, but fly low, just in case. Iravity nodded and put her hand to her shoulder. Her wings unfolded a moment later, and she took off. I'll scout ahead. The others followed after her, quickly but cautiously, with so many people competing for the dwindling number of spots. They expected an attack at any moment. A cry of surprise from around the corner made them tense, especially when they recognized the voice. At least Uravity didn't sound hurt, but they hurried regardless. They found her wrestling in midair with a familiar girl in a black bodysuit. Uravity managed to bring up one foot and kick the other girl in the chest, but she hardly reacted, easily flipping through the air and landing in a crouch. Hey, the girl called out. She sounded almost bored, but her expression suggested she was almost too excited. Wanna play with me? Sorry, we're busy, Cellophane said. Can you ask again never? The girl flipped over the lines of tape Cellophane shot at her, then twisted away from several bolts of energy from Eye Guy. She kicked him out of the way, then darted towards Cellophane, but Tsukayomi blocked her path. Dark Shadow, he shouted. Black Abyss, you got it. Dark Shadow placed himself above and behind his partner, and then seemed to surround him like a cloak. Tsukayomi's friends were just glad that he finally settled on a name for his move that was simple to say. Takoyami had gone through several long-winded names that were just edgier and edgier, until it was pointed out to him that by the time he'd finished even saying the name, his opponent would have either escaped or hit him. Dark Shadow's claws extended around Tsukayomi's arms, and he lashed out. If he'd actually connected, the blow would have easily broken a few of the girl's ribs. As it was, she nimbly ducked under his slash and staggered him with a quick kick to the jaw and danced past his guard. 
She then ran up to Cellophane and stabbed out with her nails. He threw himself to the side, but not before taking a scratch across his forearm. Froppy wrapped her tongue around the girl's arm before she could attack again, but she yelped and withdrew her tongue when the girl used her free arm to scratch it. With a wink, she then dashed away, leaving Deku's team stunned and confused. What the hell was that about? Cellophane demanded, even as Deku turned back to normal and handed him a bandage for his arm. She didn't even try to tag our targets, just, she just attacked us. Let's just be happy none of us got eliminated. Deku held out a bandage to Froppy. I'm fine, Ribbit, she said. My tongue heals fast, and it's just a scratch. Okay, now I really don't like that girl. Uravity hissed as she landed on the ground. If I see her again, I'm sending her into space. I wanna see that. Dark Shadow grumbled, partially emerged from his partner's chest. She kicked us in the face. Uravity patted him on the head. I'll make sure you've got a front row seat. Dark Shadow turned to Deku. Your girlfriend is cool. I agree, Deku said, and Uravity lightly punched his arm. No flirting during the test. With the adrenaline still coursing through him, Deku couldn't stop the words that came next. D does this mean I can flirt as much as I want after? Even through the tint on her helmet, everyone could see Uravity's blush, and they all shared a quick laugh. Okay, I think we've got it out of our systems, Cellophane said. Let's see about getting those points. This isn't what I expected, Triumph said quietly. Oh, really? Grape Juice screeched. Because I was totally expecting ninjas today. Please stop screaming in my ear. Virtus called out as he carried Grape Juice out of the way of another attack. None of Triumph's team recognized the school the dozen attacking students came from. They were sure that Deku would know, but all they could tell was that there were a bunch of ninjas with uniforms all dedicated to one color or another. They also seemed dead set on taking down Triumph and Alien Queen, to the point that they ignored the rest of their team, unless they got in the way. Why do they keep going after those two? Grape Juice asked, quietly this time. Don't they know that that's only enough points for one of them to pass? I believe that they see those them as them as the biggest threat, Virtus said. They must believe that we will rely on them to carry us to victory so they can ignore us. We, that does seem correct, Twinkling Knight agreed. But it is quite irritating to be seen as lesser, non. Virtus had long since gotten used to Ayama's frequent use of French, though it had never been adequately explained and continued to confuse him. We must swallow our pride, Virtus said. We can use their own focus against them. All Triumph and Alien Queen have to do is not get tagged. Grape Juice watched as Alien Queen gracefully dodged a boulder hurled by one of the ninjas, who apparently had a strength-enhancing quirk. I don't think that'll be a problem. All right, we wait for an opening. Virtus smiled behind his helmet when his teammates nodded. We must trust our friends to create that opening. Sure enough, the opening came when Triumph created a wave of ice that caused the ninjas to jump into the air. Grape Juice didn't need to be told, and hurled as many of his balls as he could at their legs. All his training at UA paid off, and all but one of the ninjas was tagged. The last one tried to flip out of the way, but a well-aimed blast from Twinkling Knight hit him in the chest and sent him sprawling. A moment later, all of them were frozen to the ground by triumph. Nice work, boys. Alien Queen grinned. Come on, let's get those points and get out of here. Virtus took two of the rubber balls from his container and approached one of the downed students. The girl, dressed in a green version of her peer's uniform, freed her arm and aimed her palm. Virtus had no intention of discovering what her quirk was, so he used his recipro pulse to get in close and clocked her across the jaw. My deepest apologies, he said quickly, then tagged her targets. Another student followed suit, and a minute later, the rest of the team had passed. All right. Alien Queen hugged her teammates, except for Grape Juice. Still, after a moment's hesitation, she held out her hand for a high five. That's all you get, okay? Grape Juice grinned. I'll take it. Just an update. Kids, Mira announced, at this point, another 15 students have passed. Only 40 to go. Triumph took a deep breath as his fireside warmed him up. Now we just need to wait for the rest of our class to pass. Genesis barely managed to create a buckler over her arm in time to block a small projectile. She hadn't properly braced, however, and her arm smacked against her face. Are you okay? Earphone Jack asked as they ducked behind some industrial equipment. I'm fine, Genesis said, then rubbed one eye with her free hand. I really hope that doesn't turn into a black eye. I see them, Tentacle reported, two spare sets of eyes staring off into different directions. Genesis often wondered how he did that without getting a headache. On top of two different hills, two groups of people, but they're both wearing the same kind of uniform. They're trying to keep us pinned down. Genesis created a smoke bomb and hurled it. We need cover and elevation. After creating several more smoke bombs to cover their movements, Genesis led her team to a small group of hills, 
hills that were closer to one group of attackers. Can you tell where they are and how many? She asked your phone Jack. I can try. The shorter girl plugged one of her jacks in the ground and concentrated. I can hear four, no, five different heartbeats. One of them is really calm, but two are going fast. They either shot at us with their quirks or they're nervous. The calm one is almost definitely the leader, Tailman said. Of that group, if not both, Genesis corrected. Either way, we need to take them down as quickly and as quietly as we can. Once we do, we can draw in the other group, and that should net all of us the points we need to pass. Only 25 slots available. Nira suddenly announced. Sugarman stuck his head out from what cover he had, and ducked when a sphere, no bigger than his thumb but crackling with energy, passed through the space his head had occupied a second ago. How are we gonna get over there? He asked. I'm kinda useless this far away. Same here, Tailman admitted. Genesis frowned as she gave the situation some thought. In terms of capabilities, only one of their opponents seemed to have a ranged quirk, though she couldn't discount that they had others in reserve. The other hill had at least one other ranged fighter as well, but the angle of the UA held hill meant that they were safe from that location. If the enemy organized their team to a standard level, they'll have a planner between one and two ranged fighters, one close combat specialist, and an all-rounder. Our advantage is that we have two close combat fighters, and Tentacle has incredible strength and awareness. Earphone Jack is both a sentry and range specialist, and I can support her if I have to. Our problem is that we need to get closer to effectively utilize our quirks. Think, Momo, think. Genesis crossed her arms. One of her fingers brushed against her tablet, and she paused. She then glanced down at her costume, and remembered something Hatsum had said regarding the nanotech. I can make the material look however I want. What if? She then turned on her tablet and began looking up what she had in mind. It was complicated, more so than anything she had ever made before, but its small mass meant that it wouldn't significantly drain her lipids. Give me a minute, please, she said. I think I have an idea. And Telly smiled and leaned back in her chair. The UA students had chosen a good defensive position, especially with only a few seconds to react but her team only had to keep them pinned until the rest of her class could flank their position. It was a shame that there were only five targets, but her class had already decided on the order of who would pass first. Excuse me. One of her classmates, the girl who had been pinning down Yue with her quirk, charging up small objects with energy, which she fired from her arm-mounted slingshot, called out. What is it? Intelli asked. Something is happening at the enemy position. Intelli raised an eyebrow. Elaborate, please. Of course, my apologies. The Ayurazu girl must have created more smoke, but when it cleared, I couldn't see any of them. Not even the brute with the strength quirk. Interesting. Intelli removed her monocle and cleaned it as she thought. They can't have gone far. If they leave the hill, they will be in the open. None of their quirks could be used for digging, so they aren't underground. They could be going in a straight line backwards, but we will still see them soon, if that is the case. Wait. Intelli paused when her classmate interrupted her. I thought I saw something. Define something. It was like a shimmer in the air, but it's gone now. The girl shook her head. I have no idea what's going on. Intelli frowned. We were observing Yue when they split up. The only ones with invisibility are that girl. And she was allowed to pass already, and the Midoriya boy, and he's not with this group. How could? She jumped to her feet as a thought struck her. Yay Yurazu. She must have created some kind of camouflage. Too bad for you. The echo of earphone Jack's voice was drowned out by the cracking of earth as she sent sonic shockwaves through the ground. Most of Intelli's group stumbled, so they missed Sugarman toss away a shimmering cloth to allow his teammates to attack. One of Intelli's peers stepped forward to try and block them. Her arms split apart into dozens of fleshy tendrils that lashed out but Sugarman crashed through them with a primal roar. A sugar-enhanced punch struck her in the stomach, driving the air from her lungs. Before the other girl could aim her slingshot at him, Genesis stunned her with a quick blow to her temple. A few seconds later, the rest of Intelli's team was overwhelmed by more sonic blasts from earphone jack. I really need to remember this, Genesis commented after she tagged Intelli and another of her class and examined the cloth that seemed to shimmer in the air. What? Intelli shook her head in a vain attempt to clear away the ringing. What is that? A nanotech camouflage fabric, Genesis explained. My costume was created with a similar material, but I made this based on the costume of one of my classmates. It mimics the light and color of the environment but I programmed it to ignore anything human-shaped. Intelli took a moment to process just how smart Yeyurazu had to be in order to create and program something like that in such a short amount of time. Even though she had failed the test, she was still impressed. 
you failed to take the rest of my class into account, she said, as she noticed that only three of the UA group was present. They'll overwhelm your rearguard any second. She jumped when she heard an explosion not too far away and glared at a snickering earphone jack. Sorry, the petite girl managed through her laughter. I think your friends just ran into the minefield we left behind. That will stun them long enough for Tailman and Tentacle to take them down. Genesis smiled happily. Speaking of which, Earphone Jack, you still need one more target. Why don't you head back? Sure thing, Yamomo. And Telly shook her head again. I'm impressed. Yue likes to boast about its students' abilities, but you lived up to the expectations. Genesis helped her to her feet. If it makes you feel any better, if you had attacked us immediately, instead of waiting for us to get into position, you probably would have defeated us. I needed time to think, and you gave it to me. Until he laughed, I suppose I should be happy that you passed. This means that I won't have to contend with you next year. The only warning Deku had that they were under attack was when the ground trembled. Then it exploded underneath them, causing them to scatter around the street. A moment later, at least 20 students charged in a mad rush. There are only a few slots left, he thought. Everyone must be panicking about getting their points. Some of their attackers had their quirks ready, but a few just ran forward with rubber balls in hand in a desperate bid to tag someone. Thinking quickly, he turned into Arctic Guana and covered the ground in a sheet of ice. Some of their opponents kept their footing, but others slipped and fell, while a few actually leaped over the ice. It was at that moment that Yoravity revealed a secret. The symbol on her shoulder glowed, and she aimed her right hand at one of the leaping students. There was a click, and then her hand fired like a harpoon, connected to her wrist by a long cable. Her hand connected solidly with a boy's chest, and he stopped falling. She then whipped her hand back and out again, like a flail, and caught a girl on the shoulder. Her hand then withdrew and reconnected with her wrist. Deku turned into water hazard and covered the ice with water, making it even harder to stand on. With the enemy students entirely focused on just standing, they were easy targets for cellophane, froppy, and Tsukayomi. In less than a minute, the entire group was stunned, tied up, or floating helplessly in the air. Froppy quickly counted the number of students they'd caught. Ribbit, there's more than enough for all of us. Water hazard held up a ball. Then let's get our points and get out of here. It was only a few minutes later, when they had earned their points and were heading to the entrance to the testing ground, that it really hit Midoriya. We passed. His words seemed to trigger the same shock in his friends, because Yuraraka and Asui both grabbed him in a hug, and Siro had Takoyami in a friendly headlock. We passed. Yuraraka shouted. She would have kissed Midoriya, but her helmet was still on, so she settled for hugging him even tighter. And on our first try, Ribbit, what was that thing you did with your arm, Achako? Asui let go of Midoriya, but only so that she could hug Siro next. Yeah, I was gonna ask about that, Siro said. You were holding out on us. Yuraraka scratched the back of her head, which was silly because she only touched her helmet. Yeah, Brainiac Sen added that, but I wanted to keep it secret until I could surprise you guys. Siro grinned. Um, it's a cyborg arm. I was expecting it to do something awesome. I was surprised. Midoriya offered, and his girlfriend patted him on the head. Takoyami barely managed to refrain from rolling his eyes at their antics. Dark Shadow was not nearly so disciplined. You guys are idiots. Midoriya's laugh was tinged with embarrassment. Come on, let's go find the others. Ashido's face was scarily blank. I don't believe it. No, I can't believe it. What's so hard to believe? Hiroshima scratched his cheek. The guy turned us into meatballs, and it was weird, but then Kaminari stopped him and freed us. Ashido ignored Kaminari giving her a thumbs up. No, not that. I can believe that. What I can't believe is that Bakugo said thanks. Like, should we be checking for signs of the apocalypse? Thankfully, Bakugo was off brooding in the corner and didn't hear her. Ashido was still in a good mood and didn't need the headache of him yelling at her. Hiroshima sighed. Look, I know you don't like him, but he's getting better. Maybe you should give him a chance. I'll consider it if he ever apologizes to Midori. Ashido sprinted away from Kirishima and grabbed her twin in a hug. You're here. You guys passed. Uraraka had hooked her helmet to her belt, and her grin was on full display. You know it. Did everyone in our class pass? You guys were the last, Todoroki said as he, Ida and Yeyarazu joined them. We were starting to get worried. I think you got some of the last slots. Siro made a show of wiping his brow. I guess we cut it a little close, huh? Everyone's attention was caught by a large screen that showed the testing grounds they'd just exited. Well done, everyone, Mira said over the loudspeaker. But that was just the first step. The second step is to find out who among you is skilled. 
who is just lucky. You see, the best heroes can react appropriately to any situation such as this. And the explosions began. For a brief instant, Midoriya wondered if the test had been interrupted by a villain attack. After the USJ incident in the summer camp, he was understandably a little paranoid, and he wasn't the only one. The battle against All for One had put even the older students from other schools on edge. Just a reminder, this is part of the test, Mira said, but don't get complacent. The scenario is as follows, villains have set off explosives in several areas. The heroes must coordinate search and rescue efforts, apply first aid where necessary, and bring all civilians to the evacuation center. The green square appeared on the screen showing the overhead view of the testing grounds. Keep in mind, the people you're rescuing are real, not robots or dummies. They are specially trained to mimic injuries and trauma, but if you make a mistake, they'll break character to tell you what you're doing wrong. Each of you will start with 100 points. For every mistake you make, you will be docked a percentage of your points. Fall below 50, and you'll fail the exam. You have 5 minutes to coordinate with each other, starting now. We need to split up again, Midoriya said, his mind whirling as he recalled his classmates' quirks and talents. One person with sensory-based abilities per team, and one with strength to move debris. Everyone else will have to fill in as needed. He's right. Yeyurazu frowned as other ideas came to mind. Some of us will be more useful at the evacuation center, either to protect it, provide first aid, or coordinate with other teams. Yeyurazu ended up as one of those staying behind, along with students from other schools who either had healing quirks or were good strategists. She was also useful because she could make almost anything an injured person might need. However, she created several small communicators for each UA team leader to make coordination easier. Ayama and Minta stayed behind as extra hands and guards, while Ida volunteered to be a messenger between the UA teams and those from other schools. Midoriya had Yuraka on his team. Along with Hagakure and Koda, the four of them headed towards the urban setting, which now looked more like a war zone. Bakugo headed to the mountain replica with Kirishima and a reluctant Ashido and Siro. It's just like the sports festival, Ashido muttered. Kirishima nodded. Yeah, but Bakugo's chilled out since then. Hurry the fuck up. Bakugo shouted. I'm not losing because you slackers took your sweet ass time. Siro raised an eyebrow at Kirishima. You were saying. Okay, he's chilled out a little. Todoroki, along with Asui, Takoyami and Shoji headed for what used to be a calm river, but the bombs had ruined the dam, turning it into flooded rapids. Their hope was that any part Todoroki couldn't completely freeze could at least be calmed down enough for Asui to search the water safely. The last team, made up of Kaminari, Jiro, Sato and Ajiro, headed to the industrial zone. Their plan was to use Kaminari as a shield against any damaged electrical equipment that had become dangerous, while Jiro directed the other two to rescue anyone trapped. Good luck, everyone, Deku said into his comms. Don't forget, we're not competing against the other schools anymore. Call for help if you need it. Roger that, Triumph said curtly. I read you loud and clear, Vice Prez, Earphone Jack said. I don't need any fucking Ground Zero's voice abruptly cut out, and they could hear scuffling and distant swearing for a moment. We got it, Red Riot said after a few seconds, and then set his earpiece to receive before Ground Zero went into a colorful tirade. The urban setting was even worse up close. Not a single window was intact, and every building either leaned precariously, or had collapsed into rubble. Deku hardly knew where to start, he had seen videos of All Might saving everyone on a street, or in a building, but this represented an entire city. We, Deku took a deep, steadying breath. We need a better idea of what we're looking at. Anima, can you call some birds for us? Your avidity, you should also get in the air, just in case, you can rescue anyone trapped on a rooftop or high window. With a nod, Yuravity used her quirk on herself, deployed her wings, and took off. Anima called out, and several dozen birds of various species flew in. He took a moment to explain to them what he wanted, and then they scattered. We'll stay on the ground, Deku said to Invisible Girl. I'll turn into wild mud and try to pick up the scent of blood. If they really want to make this realistic, they'll have something like that. Invisible Girl hadn't activated her costume yet, so Deku could see her collar move forward an exaggerated nod. Sure thing. It didn't take long for Deku's hunch to be proven correct. Wild Mutt picked up something that smelled like blood, though its synthetic quality made it smell like liquid rubber had been mixed in. He located the source and tried to call out for the victim. Instead, he let out a series of growls and barks. W what's that? A young sounding voice cried out. Is some animal coming to eat me? Maybe I should do this part, Invisible Girl offered, and carefully climbed through a broken window. Hang on, we're coming to get you. Wildmud waited impatiently outside, until he heard her call out again. 
Deku, I could use some light in here. Wild Mutt turned into Buzzshock and flew after her. Do you need to get behind me? Your shadows might throw off any light I make. No, I don't cast a shadow, Invisible Girl said helpfully. Light just passes through me. With that settled, Buzzshock created a small orb of electricity over his head. The light was enough to let them see what looked like a small boy, his leg pinned under several chunks of concrete, and blood dripping down the side of his head. And my head hurts, the boy whimpered. And I don't know where my daddy is. Okay, think, the kid is injured, but there could be someone else trapped as well. Do we split up after rescuing him, or... Hey, the boy now had the voice of a grown man. Don't just stop and think. You need to prioritize and act. If there's an injured child, and you can't see anyone else, you rescue the child. You can't be sure if there's a parent nearby, especially if the kid has a head injury. You don't have time to worry about anything except what's right in front of you. If you try to act on something while thinking about something else, there's a good chance you'll fail at both. Buzzshock flinched from the tongue lashing, but he knew it was deserved, he still hadn't shaken his habit of analyzing everything. What mattered, however, was right in front of him, a hurt child. Okay, here's what's going to happen, he said. I'll turn into four arms and hold up the debris. Invisible girl, you pull him free and get outside. I'll try to keep everything from collapsing, but if it does, I can turn into Ghost Freak, so I'll be fine. Got it, boss. There was a rustle of clothing near the victim, and some of his hair brushed aside, seemingly on its own. You're going to be okay. Four arms bulk made it a tight fit, but he was able to get two hands under the debris. He slowly lifted the rubble, careful to not cause more to rain down. As soon as the boy was no longer trapped, Invisible Girl lifted him into her arms. She kept him as steady as possible to not jostle either of his injuries. Okay, we're clear. She called out. Four arms turned into Ghost Freak and flew out, immune to the fist-sized chunks of concrete that rained down and threw him. One down, Deku said as he turned back to normal. Let's get him to the evacuation site, and then we can look for more. You can drop him off faster with XLR8, Invisible Girl said. I can work with your avidity and anima while you're gone. Good point. Deku took out his communicator and handed it to her. Take this, just in case. You, gross, this was in your ear. Invisible Girl laughed, and then the earpiece vanished behind her invisible hair. Just messing with you. Good luck, Deku. Mira nodded to himself. The students had reacted remarkably well to the second part of the exam. All Might's retirement may have shaken the current generation of heroes, but the up-and-coming generation seemed to have taken it as a challenge. They were determined to make sure that everything All Might had built would not crumble on their watch. Of course, determination only got you so far. The HPSC needed to know that the Heroes Society would be putting its faith and wouldn't freeze in the face of a true threat. Short of actually unleashing villains on them, this next step was the best they could do in controlled conditions. You're up, he said into his phone. Make it look good. It took XLR8 only a minute to return to the evacuation site, where he handed the victim over to a student from another school. Injuries. The girl, who was probably at least a year older than Deku, was all business. Head trauma and possible sprains in his legs. Normally, Midoriya would have had a problem speaking to a stranger, especially a girl. But he was treating this test like it was real. He couldn't afford to stutter here. The other student examined the actor. Even if he didn't really have any injuries, she pretended that he did. Okay, looks like a minor concussion and scalp laceration. But his legs seem to only have some bad bruises. I'll patch him up, don't worry. Thanks. Just before XLR8 was about to leave, he was nearly bowled over by another explosion. This one much closer than before. Oh, what now? His question was answered by Mira over the speakers. The villains have attacked again. They're heading for the evacuation site. However, there are still civilians trapped. Can you save those who need to be saved, protect those who need to be protected, and stop the villains at the same time? Real heroes can. Out of the smoke strode a massive figure, Mount Lady, at more than 60 feet tall. Put her hands on her hips. Well, 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 she boomed. Looks like a bunch of easy prey, huh, Orca? The humanoid Orca in a suit brushed some dust off his sleeve. Indeed. Let's see how these heroes can stand against us, if they can at all. Minions, attack. Dozens of people in skin-tight black outfits and arm-mounted cannons swarmed around the villains. These were gang orcas psychics, all roped into playing the part of lesser criminals. What the students didn't know, what they would never know, was that the psychics had spent a good 20 minutes giggling uncontrollably when they'd been presented with their temporary costumes. They had only gotten serious when gang orca threatened to cut their pay for a week. Deku froze for less than a second, not out of fear, but because he was furiously thinking of what to do. We need combat specialists to hold them off, while everyone else focuses on rescue. 
Genesis, he shouted, but his friend was already sprinting towards him. What do you need? She asked. Spread the word that we need the heaviest hitters to hold the line, and we need them now. I'll buy as much time as I can until reinforcements arrive. This was bringing up dark memories of his fight with Muscular and Chimera. The last time he had gone up against two close combat specialists, it hadn't gone well for him. A small part of him wondered if they had based this part of the test off his encounter. Be careful, Genesis said. I'll start working on defenses here in case some slip past you. She didn't think Deku was incapable, but he couldn't be everywhere at once, and it wasn't fair to assume that he could do everything. She wished that she could be out there on the front lines with him, but she knew that she was better suited to fighting defensively and coordinating efforts. Deku nodded, then turned into Jetray and flew off, but Genesis had stopped paying attention to him. She was busy speaking into her communicator, while she also created a collection of minds that she handed out to students from other schools, who wordlessly began spreading them out around the evacuation site. A single stretch was left open to allow other students to continue bringing in their victims. Once the minefield was complete, Genesis allowed herself a few moments to rest and ate a high-calorie protein bar. She had done all she could and now could only hope that reinforcements reached Midoriya in time. Mount Lady was relatively new on the pro hero scene, but she had spent years training to compensate for her quirk's weaknesses. Intellectually, Jetre knew that, but it was another thing entirely to actually deal with it. With his incredible speed and the general slowness that came with most gigantification quirks, he had thought he could easily outmaneuver Mount Lady while staying safely out of reach of Gang Orca. That opinion quickly changed when he just barely avoided Mount Lady's fist, and the air pressure from the blow sent him flying awkwardly back. Nice try, Mount Lady said with a sneer. You think you're the first person to think that they could beat me by being faster. I've trained to deal with quick ones like you. Jetre idly wondered if Ben would have made some clever quip. He probably would, so would Hawks, or All Might. Maybe, one day, Midoriya would be confident enough to fight verbally as well as physically. But at that moment, he wasn't. He remained in character for the situation, which included injured civilians and fellow heroes trying to save them. If the small army of villains got past him, people could be hurt, including his friends. Fine, let's try something else. In a flash of green light, Human Gaussor appeared and roared as he grew to his maximum size. He was still a little shorter than Mount Lady, but where she had height, he definitely had mass. His fist collided with her gut, sending her skidding back and creating deep furrows in the ground. When some of Gang Orca's men tried to get around him, his enormous tail swept out, taking down almost half in a single blow. The only way past is by beating me, he growled, his deep voice rattling the bones of those closest. And more heroes will be here any minute. Surrender while you can, or I'm afraid you're going to get hurt. Impressive resolve, Gang Orca said. His arms were crossed, and he seemed unimpressed. Then again, his features were so far from human that it was impossible to tell for sure. However, you will need more than that to defeat us. That's why I'm also going to punch you. Human Gausser tried just that. But Gang Orca nimbly leaped over his hand and then ran up his arm. Rather than punch or kick Human Gausor, Gang Orca took a deep breath. Deku's encyclopedic knowledge of heroes kicked in, and he had half a second to realize what Gang Orca was going to do before it happened. Gang Orca unleashed a high pitched blast of echolocation right into his ear, and for a moment, it actually felt like a bomb had gone off in his head. He roared in pain and fell to his knees. His vision went white from the agony, so he didn't see Mount Lady's fist until it slammed into his jaw, and he felt something crack. Instinctively, Deku turned into swamp fire to heal his injuries before they became debilitating. It also came with the advantage of becoming a smaller target for Mount Lady, who had to catch Gang Orca before he hit the ground. They and the closest of Gang Orca's minions backed off when swamp fire hurled several fireballs at them. They weren't very strong but few people could stand still and just let someone throw fire at them. Swampfire used the brief pause to take stock of his surroundings. There were too many villains for him to keep contained, and some were already getting around him. He needed backup, or the defenses around the evacuation site would be tested sooner than expected. Deku, move. Swampfire threw himself to the side, just in time to avoid a barrage of ice from behind. Mount Lady shattered it with a single punch, but it bought a few more precious seconds. Triumph melted the ice around his right side as he calmly walked forward. Ribbit, are you okay, Deku? Froppy asked as she hopped up to him. I'm fine. Swampfire hesitated. Um, no offense, but are you sure you can handle this fight? Froppy's face remained blank. Actually, I came because I had to carry Triumph, but I'm not going to leave you guys behind. We should have more backup any second now. 
Thanks, Swampfire cracked his knuckles. I'll take Mount Lady and try to keep the minions back. Froppy, you take down anyone who gets past me. Triumph, you need to pin down Gang Orca. He doesn't do well against heat, oh, and don't let him get close. Flames erupted from Triumph's left side. Understood. Got it, Ribbit. Go. The Omnitrix dial twisted and the four spikes emerged. Ultimate Swamp Fire. Where Swamp Fire had stood tall and proud, his ultimate form was hunched and almost looked grumpy. Instead of green, his body was a gray wood-like substance dotted with clusters of blue, with a much larger blue orb on his back and another containing his face. Strangely, he didn't smell as bad as before, though no one was complaining. Triumph and Ultimate Swamp Fire attacked at almost the same time, but while the former's flames remained the same, the latter's had shifted to a deep blue. The fire, condensed almost to a beam, slammed into Mount Lady's side, and she fell back. Ultimate Swamp Fire had held back, but Mount Lady was still left with an ugly burn from her hip to her sternum. Ouch, Mount Lady hissed in pain as she glared at her attacker. Took the kid gloves off, huh? Ultimate Swamp Fire gave her a cocky smile, not necessarily because he felt overconfident, but because Midoriya had done his research on such a popular up-and-coming hero. Mount Lady didn't like being taunted in any way, and it caused her to lash out when she shouldn't. The young woman growled and brought up her leg for an axe kick. Ultimate Swamp Fire jumped back as the leg came down, but reached up and grabbed some blue goop from the shell on his back. He tossed the sludge at where he'd been seconds earlier, and just as Mount Lady's foot was about to impact, he threw some fire at the spot. The goop exploded with the force of a bomb, sending Mount Lady staggering back with another burn on her heel. Minions, Gang Orca shouted as he put debris between him and Triumph's fire. Focus your attacks on Deku. Ultimate Swamp Fire had about two seconds to be giddy that a top 10 hero knew his name and was then distracted by a horde of very angry pretend villains. He used a very weak stream of fire to keep them from getting close, but he had to keep one eye on Mount Lady, and didn't aim as well as he normally would have. Two men got around the fire and aimed their arm guns at him, but one was smacked in the face by Froppy's tongue, and the other was taken down by a kick that had all the proportional strength of a frog behind it. Thanks, he said. No problem, Ribbit, but there are a lot of them. Froppy backed off from the heat of the flames. We might need backup. As if the universe heard her, a massive gust of wind bowled over most of the minions with enough force to knock them out. Ultimate Swamp Fire and Froppy heard booming laughter and looked up to see Urashi hovering above them, carried by his own wind. His costume was a bulky outfit of browns and black, with a long cape and an enormous glove over one hand, with his shikesu hat planted firmly on his head. You need help down there. He called. Don't worry, Gale Force is ready for action. It took all of Froppy's considerable self-control not to jump 20 feet into the air when Virtus skidded to a stop right next to her. One of the Shikesu students told me that Gale Force was one of the best for such a situation, and after I found him, I decided to follow and offer what assistance I could. Ultimate Swamp Fire nodded, then looked up at Gale Force. Can you help Triumph deal with Gang Orca? I can handle Mount Lady. Gale Force gave him a thumbs up, but then frowned when some of the minions got to their feet. What about them? Froppy waved to get his attention. Virtus and I can clean up, you guys handle the big threats. Gale Force grinned and gave her a two-fingered salute. You got it. Virtus engines flared. Let's go, Froppy. Ribbit. Froppy's tongue waved like a cobra about to strike. Ultimate Swamp Fire took a moment to appreciate his friends having his back, and then turned to focus on Mount Lady. Time to give up, don't you think? Mount Lady laughed. Ha, huh? you think a few burns are enough to stop me? I got put through way worse when I was training at your age. She scooped up several chunks of concrete, each the size of a person. I hope you dodge these, kid, because it's gonna hurt otherwise. Just as the makeshift projectiles left her hands, they were shattered by bursts of blue fire and she was peppered by superheated shrapnel. Funny, Ultimate Swamp Fire said, I was going to say the same to you. Triumph knew that if this had been a real fight, he would have lost. Gang Orca might have had a weakness to extreme heat, but he'd been a pro hero for years, and had probably dealt with villains with quirks that were a poor matchup for him more times than he could count. As it was, Gang Orca had to hold back enough to give him a chance, though it didn't feel like it. Every time Triumph came close to actually hitting the pro with his flames, he would have to create a small barrier of ice, or otherwise dive out of the way when Gang Orca hurled a chunk of debris at him with the force of a small meteor. Orcas are pretty much all muscle, Triumph thought to himself. Of course this guy would have that same kind of strength. He fired another jet of flame, but when it faded, he found that Gang Orca was nowhere to be seen. 
the only warning triumph had that his opponent had used the fire to block his vision was when he saw Gang Orca's fist heading right at his face. This is going to hurt. Fortunately for him, he was saved at the last second. A small tornado literally snatched him out of harm's way and carried him into the air, where Gale Force was already hovering. Hey, Todoroki, the other student said. You having a tough time with this guy? Triumph nodded his thanks. Yeah, he's more nimble than he looks, and he's strong. If we let him get close, we're done. He suddenly had an idea. Hey, how good is your control over your quirk? Gale Force grinned. If you need me to do something, I'd bet I could. Triumph smirked. We're going to catch a whale. Down on the ground, Gang Orca watched the two students warily. Todoroki was already proving to be a challenge, and I read the file on Yurashi. Both of those boys could easily make it into the top 10 once they graduate. Honestly, I'd probably have a hard time fighting both of them, even if I wasn't told to hold back. Still, I'm curious to see how they'll deal with me. He got his answer soon enough. Gale Force created a thin twister around him, while Triumph fed a stream of fire into a channel of wind that led into the twister. Rather than a focused blast of fire, it spread out among the tornado, turning the air hot and dry. In seconds, Gang Orca felt his skin lose all moisture, and it became harder to breathe. He took a water bottle from his belt and emptied the contents on his head, but it did little to stave off the inevitable. Like him, the students were holding back. Had they put more power into this move, Gang Orca very well might have died. As it was, he knew he would be feeling miserable for days. Thankfully, his torment ended with the sound of a buzzer. Okay, kids, time's up. Pack it in and get changed. You'll be receiving your final scores shortly. The heat twister died out, and Gang Orca took several gulps of air. His eyes were closed, so he was surprised when he was struck by two large streams of water that soothed his dry skin. Sorry, sir. Water Hazard shrugged apologetically. I knew that heat was your weakness, so that was why I sent Triumph after you, but I also know that water helps you recover faster. Gang Orca blinked. He hadn't expected such kindness from Midoriya, though his file had suggested a generosity of spirit. He was also pleasantly surprised to see Triumph and Gale Force giving rudimentary aid to Mount Lady. Triumph created a fine mist of ice, which Gale Force moved to cover her burns. Not too far away, Virtus and Froppy were helping some of Gang Orca's sidekicks to their feet. Gang Orca wasn't one for sentiment, but if these children were any indication, then the next generation of heroes would be a good one. Once Class 1 got changed into their school uniforms, they joined the other students in front of the podium. There, Mira and a small group of men in suits were waiting. First of all, I want to say that all of you performed well, even if you didn't pass, Mira said. You 100 students have bright futures ahead of you, but for some, those futures will be here a little sooner. He jerked his thumb over his shoulder at the screen behind him. If the screen shows your name, that means you passed. I'll give you a few minutes to check. Midoriya's eyes were glued to the screen, and he barely even felt Uraraka's metal hand slip into his left and squeeze. All around him, students muttered prayers as they searched for their names. And then he saw it. For one glorious moment, it felt like the world was full of light as he saw his name on the screen. Deku-kun, Uraraka whispered. I passed. Midoriya's vision was blurry from tears as he looked at her. And me too. Siro grabbed his shoulder. We all passed. It wasn't just the rising stars who had passed. In fact, out of the hundred students, 87 names were on the screen. Asui hugged Siro's arm. Ribbit, I think our whole class passed. Kirishima coughed to get their attention. Actually, one of us didn't. Bakugo, the only class when a student not on the screen, looked like he was about three seconds away from committing homicide. What? The? Fuck? Now, you'll be getting a review of your performance during the test, Mira continued. If you failed, you'll see why. Midoriya held out his hand for the paper an HPSC employee gave him. He and his friends went from being about to celebrate to completely focused on their scores. Midoriya felt a surge of pride when he saw that he had 90 points remaining. He had been docked 10 points for his brief hesitation, but had been commended for his good planning and leadership skills. Midoriya had never seen himself as a leader before, but maybe he was better than he gave himself credit for. His friends had also done well. The lowest score belonged to Ashido at 70. She had lost a good chunk of points while melting away some debris, but had accidentally triggered a collapse that would have landed on one of the civilians, had Siro not caught it with his tape in time. Yeyarazu managed to not only get the highest score of UA students, but also the highest score of the entire test with 94 points. She had shown exemplary leadership while organizing the evacuation zone, had remained calm under pressure, and had even helped prepare defenses, though they hadn't been needed. Bakugo had failed with 49 points, he hadn't done much in the way of rescuing, mostly barking orders at his team, and when some civilians had asked for his help, 
he had just insulted them and told them to save themselves. Hiroshima's insistence that Bakugo had changed for the better hadn't done anything to sway the judges. Now, for those of you who didn't pass, Mira's eyes drooped, and he shook himself awake. You have two choices. You can wallow in self-pity and try again next year, or you can take the makeup exam. If you take the second option, you'll have to take a special course on top of your regular classes, and if your grades slip, you'll be pulled from that course and forced to wait for the next exam. Beck Hugo crossed his arms. You won't scare me off that easily. I'm taking the course, and I'm getting my damn license. The other students who'd failed echoed his sentiment. They hadn't come so far just to wait another year, especially the third-year students who wouldn't have another chance anyway. If Mira was expecting anything else, he didn't show it, and only nodded once. That's what I thought. Anyway, for those of you who passed, you'll receive your provisional licenses before you leave. Keep in mind that these are provisional. You will be allowed to respond to emergencies that happen in front of you, such as assisting in accidents or stopping petty crime. If an actual villain attack happens, your job will be to help civilians to safety, and to only fight if you have no other options. If a fully licensed hero is on the scene, you will follow their instructions to the letter as if you were a psychic. Mira sighed. There are other rules and regulations that you'll have to follow, but your teachers will cover the details if they haven't already. Also, if you think that these licenses will give you permission to go out on patrol or act like the real deal, you're sorely mistaken. We can take these licenses away faster than you can blink, so don't mess up. Midoriya nodded to himself. He had studied hero regulations for years, even before he got into UA. The authority granted by a provisional license was extremely limited, but it was one step below sidekick, and then full-fledged hero. He glanced down at the Omnitrix and thought back to his first real friend. I'm almost there, Ben, he thought. Just you wait. I will be a hero. The universe away. Ben Tennyson sat in his favorite chair and took a long drink from his smoothie. It had been a long day in the watchtower, using gray matter to coordinate the entire Justice League, and even his super-intelligent brain had been close to fried by the time his shift had ended. How does Mr. Terrific do this all the time? He asked himself. If we actually got paid for this, I'd ask for a raise. Honey, we're rich, Kara called out from upstairs. We don't need to get paid. Ben silently grumbled about aliens with super hearing. It's the principle of the thing. Kara laughed, and Ben grumbled some more. He opened his mouth to speak, but stopped when he felt his phone vibrate. He pulled it out of his pocket, and saw that Midoriya had sent him something. I didn't know he could text me using the Omnitrix, he muttered as he opened his phone. A moment later, he smiled. Hey, Kara, come see what Izuku sent me. Kara floated down the stairs and over to him. Did he get kidnapped again? No, but twice in less than two months would be impressive. Ben handed her the phone. Check it out. Kara saw that Midoriya had sent a text, followed by a picture, and she smiled. I wouldn't be here without you. Thank you so much. The picture looked like a driver's license. It had an ID code and some of Midoriya's personal information. The image next to it was Midoriya's face, though the smile he tried to give the photographer was wobbly and nervous. Provisional license, huh? Kara rolled her eyes, but her voice was fond. Does he know that we don't really have context for that here? Ben pretended to wipe a tear from his eye. Barely 16 and already has permission from the government to save the day. I don't think I ever got that back on my old earth. And so proud. Seriously, though, he's been through a lot in just a few months. Kara sat on the arm of Ben's chair and put her hand on his shoulder. Do you really think he's okay? Ben thought about it for a moment. I think he's getting there. That's what matters, that he keeps moving forward. Bye, Eraser. Ms. Joke waved as Aizawa got onto his bus. I'll send you a time and place. Ashido, still riding the high of getting her license, grinned and waggled her eyebrows. Ooh, what's that about, Aizawa-sensei? Joke is giving me advice on how to deal with nosy students, Aizawa growled. We're debating how long their detentions should last. He glanced over his shoulder. You've got five minutes to be on this bus, or we're leaving without you. Ashido shrugged and went over to her friends. Midori, have you ever looked relaxed in front of a camera? Candid shots don't count. Midoriya tried to keep his smile off his face and failed. W.L. It's just that this is such a big deal, and I get nervous when I do important things. Ashido nodded sagely, then grabbed Yuraraka and shoved her in his direction. This is important things. It took Midoriya and Yuraraka about one second to realize what she meant. They went redder than anyone had ever seen and turned into a sputtering mess. Ashido cackled at their embarrassment, and missed her boyfriend get pulled away from the group. Is there something you need? Todoroki asked, once they were far enough away. I just... Yurashi scratched the back of his head. I just wanted to apologize. I had a pretty bad view of you as a person, 
and I was wrong. Todoroki raised an eyebrow. I have no idea what you're talking about. Well, during the test for UA, for recommended students, we raced each other. Irashi refused to break eye contact. Back then, when I saw that look in your eye, you reminded me of all the worst parts of Endeavor. Todoroki went very still. I'm nothing like him. I kind of figured when I saw you again today. Irashi gestured with his chin in the direction of the rising stars. When you are hanging out with those guys, you're happy. I don't think Endeavor is happy around anyone. He really isn't. Still, Todoroki thought about how much he had changed since the sports festival. He'd gained more friends in one week than he'd had in his entire life. He also had a girlfriend that, even a few months ago, he would have considered completely unsuited for him. Thanks for reminding me that I'm better than I was. Yurashi smiled. Anyway, I just wanted to get that off my chest. I hope you become a hero that fights with as much passion as I do. That'll prove that you're better than Endeavor. Uh, sure. Todoroki was certainly better than he used to be. But being openly passionate about anything wasn't his thing. And never would be. I should get back to my class. Yeah, same. I'm the only first year from Shaiksu, so everyone's gonna lecture me if I step out of line. Irashi waved as he ran off. See you later, Todoroki. Todoroki shook his head as he walked back. What a weird guy. Yeirazu was the first to spot him coming back. What was that about? I'm not sure, Todoroki said. That Yurashi just needed to get some stuff off his chest, I guess. He glanced at Midoriya and Yuraraka. How much longer are they going to freak out for? If Mina keeps teasing them, they'll never stop. Yeirazu sighed. Please restrain her. On it, Todoroki tapped his girlfriend on the shoulder. Mina, yeah. As soon as Ashido turned, Todoroki brought his face inches away from hers, waited three seconds, and then winked. Ashido turned an interesting shade of purple and sputtered gibberish. Todoroki guided her into the bus, while Siro and Asui did the same for Midoriya and Yuraraka. Yeyurazu sighed and looked at Ida. Do you think they'll ever stop? Perhaps. Ida smiled. But it would be extremely strange if it ever did. You might be right. Yeyurazu turned to address the rest of the class. Everyone on the bus. We're going home. Well, Shigaraki leaned back in his ratty old chair. Did you get it? Toga grinned and held out two plastic vials, each containing a few droplets of blood. One vial was marked with a frog sticker, while the other just had a piece of tape stuck to it. Yep, we still need blood from that pretty Yeyurazu girl, right? Then you'll have everything you need. Everything on our end? Yeah. Shigaraki carefully took the vials from her. I'll make sure you get to keep a drop or two. The doctor only needs one for his project. Once he's done, nothing will be able to stop me. Tartarus prison was renowned for being inescapable. Each prisoner was equipped with quirk-suppressing shackles that could be magnetized together to restrain them. Automated turrets were aimed at every cell, and 100 heroes specifically trained to guard the prison were on hand to help the regular guards at any given time. If there was an emergency, the entire facility could be covered in retractable tungsten shielding to prevent an invasion or an escape. And any hero who worked within a hundred miles of Tartarus was required by law to respond to any call for aid from the facility, with the priority superseding any other. There were backups for their backups, and the encryption around their computer systems was better than any other in the country, and possibly the world. There had never been a successful escape attempt, in fact, no one had ever come close. However, no one was taking chances with the newest prisoner. All for one sat in his chair, bound and unable to move, connected to dozens of tubes that fed chemicals into his body that kept him alive. If he even attempted to use a quirk, the machines monitoring his brain would send out a kill signal, shutting off his life support and clearing the six turrets to riddle him with armor-piercing rounds. Normally, they would have also put quirk-suppressing shackles on him, but since no one was quite sure which quirks had been keeping him alive, they had to resort to a more extreme measure of containment. It's still not enough, All Might said from the observation room. He was in his skinny form, but Gran Torino and Sir Nighteye could tell that he was seconds away from transforming. If they add any more, it will violate at least three different laws regarding humane treatment of prisoners, Nighteye said. When it comes to All for One, there's no such thing as too many safeguards. Gotta agree with Tashinori on this one. Gran Torino crossed his arms. The bastard is too crafty to take any chances. Night I conceded the point with a nod. Are you sure you want to go down there, All Might? There is every possibility that he is expecting you. I'd be surprised if he wasn't, but I have to try this. All Might sighed. Even if I can't get any details from him, maybe he'll say something useful. He paused. What he was about to say might well break the fragile friendship he'd rebuilt with his former psychic. If you want to be absolutely sure that this isn't a trap, you could use your quirk on me. Night I stared at him, composure forgotten. Considering the last time I did that, are you sure? 
If you see a danger, I promise that I won't even try going down there. All Might was certain that he would be fine, though. He's already foreseen my death, and if it was today, he'd never be so calm. Very well. It would put my mind at ease, if nothing else. Night I put his hand on All Might's shoulder and looked him in the eye to activate his quirk. Three seconds later, it was over. I did not see any risk to you or this facility during the ten minutes they will give you. All Might smiled grimly. Thank you, Mirai. Night I blinked. The last time All Might had called him by his real name had been before they'd fallen out. He would deny it forever, but for a moment, it felt like old times. Even if All Might is fated to die early, I know that we will have mended that fence. When that dark day comes, perhaps we will part without regrets. Good to see you again, All Might. All for one grinned behind his breath mask. Have you come to gloat? We are both crippled. Yes, but I am the one who cannot even scratch my nose without risk of being shot. And you're locked up forever, All Might pointed out. He had transformed just before entering the cell. He was ready for a fight, even with the safeguards and a foot-thick wall of bulletproof glass separating them. If it helps you sleep at night to think that, go right ahead. I speak from experience when I say that a peaceful night's rest does wonders for one's health. All for one shrugged, and the turrets whirred as they tracked his every motion. Now, why have you come here? Surely it's not to inquire about my health. All Might scowled. Shigaraki, I want to know where he is, and what he's planning. Please, I spent years teaching that boy to be independent. In fact, I explicitly told him to never tell me about his future plans. Don't try to fool me. Shigaraki was your successor, and you'd want to make sure that he'd succeed in whatever sick plans you gave him. Quite the opposite, actually. I merely asked what Shigaraki wanted, and then I taught him what he needed in order to make his own dreams a reality. All Might leaned forward. Where is he? I don't know. He could be lying low on the other side of the planet, or he could be hiding in the sewers of Tokyo. Personally, I like the idea that he has an underwater base off the coast of China. I considered doing something similar after our fight six years ago, but it's so hard to get good ramen at the bottom of the sea. All Might stood up. You have three seconds to tell me something useful, or I'm leaving you to wallow in solitude for the rest of your unnatural life. All for one side. You really should lighten up, All Might. Shigaraki is no longer your concern, but that of your own successor, Tagata Mirio, yes. They are destined to clash, just as you and I were. All Might took a step backward. Oh, very well. You've humored me by providing me with human interaction, so I will tell you something. All Might sat down. Talk. I don't know Shigaraki's location or his plans, but I can tell you what he wants. Even better, I'll warn you how easy it is for him to achieve his goal, because I know that you cannot do anything about it, and that is worse than letting you stew in ignorance. When I found Shigaraki, he had nothing, no family, no home, and no one who even bothered to help him. Everyone ignored him as they passed him on the street, because they were certain that a hero would take care of it for them. Why bother standing up for yourself when you have guardians to keep you in complacency? Did you know that more people are apathetic towards civil issues than at any other point since the Black Plague? It's honestly quite fascinating. After all, why care about something when someone else not only can do it for you, they constantly spout drivel about not needing to worry, because they will handle things. You're babbling, All Might growled. Get to the point. My apologies, where was I? Ah, uh, yes, Shigaraki needed someone to take care of him, so I did. Granted, knowing that he was Shimura Nana's grandson was a factor, but I didn't point him in the direction of crime. All I ever asked was what he wanted to do. His answer was that he wanted to make a world where there were no heroes. If you cannot rely on others, you will be forced to stand up for yourself, and if you do not need outside help, then heroes will not need to exist. All for one grinned. And once there are no heroes, Shigaraki will have no one to stand in his way as he becomes king from the darkness. Whether he will be content to rule only Japan from the shadows, or spread his reach to the entire world is entirely up to him. What all for one could see in his enemy's face was more rewarding than if he'd killed All Might all those years ago. He had tried to remain composed during that speech, but all for one could see his fear. All Might dreaded the return to that age of chaos and anarchy, before the rise of heroes. Back then, All for One's reach was almost without limit, and his successor wanted to become that same kind of monster. It won't happen, All Might said. Even if I can't stop Shigaraki, young Tagata has power beyond even what I was capable of in my prime. More than that, he won't be as foolish as I was when we fought. He will bring the light of every other hero together, and they will burn away that darkness. All for one chuckled. If you want to believe that, then by all means. Your arrogance will only make it easier for Shigaraki. You think that Tagata can match you, the symbol of peace. You spent decades convincing everyone that you were all that Japan needed to be safe, and now you are gone, a shadow of your former self. You set the bar insurmountably high, 
And even if someone like Tagata or Midoriya manages to surpass you in power, neither of them will bring hope like you did. Faith in heroes is already degrading, and every move Shigaraki makes will only make it erode faster. All Might paused, young Midoriya. For the first time, all for one smile dropped, and he said nothing. He didn't need to, he had already slipped up. You took young Midoriya, All Might said, partly to himself. You had Shigaraki do it, and he had his own reasons, but you were the one who wanted young Midoriya. He leaned in closer to the glass. What is your connection to that boy? I will tell you nothing. All for one's grin returned, but even All Might could tell it was forced. If you truly wish to know, perhaps Midoriya will tell you. Just ask him about a man named Asmuth. Who knows, perhaps you'll be the one to discover the answers I have been seeking all this time. It would be a fine torment, you know, if you were to find the truth, you could dangle it in front of me all you want, and I would be unable to do a thing about it. All might turn to leave, that might be something you would do, but not me. Goodbye, all for one, the next time I see you will be when I watch you get put in a pine box and buried. All for one was silent as all might left, but when he was left alone, he smiled again. This time, it was genuine. You should know better, all might, I never slip up. You may think that your successor is all that is needed for a bright future, but my only fear is that Tagata and Midoriya fight together against Shigaraki. If you become suspicious of Midoriya, I imagine that your successor will be as well, and that is all I need to keep Tamura one step ahead of you. Everything is proceeding as I'd planned. Shigaraki was in a better mood than normal, and though that still meant that he would kill anyone who angered him, he'd at least consider sparing them. Nothing felt better than a plan going off without a hitch. Toga had retrieved what he needed, and even though the heroes would eventually find out, there was no way she had been tracked. He had just gone to the meager kitchen to see what he could eat, when Kirajiri emerged from one of his portals with twice. Shigaraki Tamura, we have returned. How did the meeting go? Shigaraki asked. Kirajiri turned to twice, who nodded vigorously. Perfect. They want to meet you and discuss a co-opus. Twice had become a great deal more sane since discovering that he was not, in fact, a clone. He had connected that sanity to his association with the League of Villains and his dedication to the group, and Shigaraki in particular was now absolute. As long as it made Twice more competent and loyal, Shigaraki was all for it. Interesting. I thought they'd wait at least a day before giving their answer. Shigaraki fished a bottle of water from the fridge. What did you make of them, Kirajiri? We only met one of the lieutenants, but he seemed competent. The soldiers he brought with him were little more than thugs. If it came down to a full battle, I believe we would have the upper hand. However, they have money and connections, something we sorely lack at the moment. That's something I want to ask them when we meet. Shigaraki pulled the hand off his face and placed it on his knee so that he could take a drink. The Yakuza have been small timers since even before All Might showed up, so how do they have the kind of cash we're talking about? Oh, I got the answer to that from my contact. Twice his chest puffed up with pride. Turns out, these Yakuza are the ones who make Trigger. That got Shigaraki's attention. Really, that certainly makes things more interesting. Twice set up the meet, they can pick the place, but we choose the time. I want to have Toga and Kirajiri scouted out first. Kirajiri bowed. Understood. I will inform Toga-san and prepare. Shigaraki waited until his underlings had left before allowing himself to smile. If things went well, the League of Villains would soon be back in business. Class 1 was in various states of consciousness. After getting back from the exam and cleaning up, most of the students had immediately gone to bed, while the rising stars spent a little time in the living room. I am exhausted. Ashido whined as she flopped onto the couch. I'm gonna sleep for a week. I'm pretty sure you'll miss school, Todoroki said idly, not looking up from his phone. And do you really want to risk getting on Aizawa Sensei's bad side? That implies he has a good side, Ribbit. Asui had her eyes closed and her head rested against Siro's shoulder, but spoke as if she was completely awake. Actually, Aizawa Sensei mentioned an announcement tomorrow morning, Midoriya said. I think it has something to do with us getting our provisional licenses. Probably paperwork or something, Ashido dismissed. I'd like to do something more exciting, like another internship, Yuraraka admitted. The last big thing we did at school before today was the training camp, and, well, Yeyurazu smiled weakly. Perhaps we could stand to do something slightly less exciting than that. Actually, I would not mind another internship, Ida said brightly. I just got a text from my brother, and he is officially returning to active duty as of tomorrow. His friends immediately broke out in cheers. That's wonderful, Tenya, Yeyurazu said, and gave him a quick hug. Ida flailed about for a moment, flustered. Yes, well, he said that I would be on the top of his list of interns, though he also said that he would not mind any of you joining me. All this is just theoretical, right? Todoroki returned his attention to his phone. 
We still don't know if we'll even have another internship this year. Ashido frowned at him. Okay, what is so important that you're basically ignoring us? Todoroki raised an eyebrow at her. I was texting my brother, he's setting up a video call for my mom tonight. Do you want to meet her? I, oh what? You, meet my mom. Do you want to? Todoroki shrugged. I told her I had a girlfriend, but she doesn't know much about you. Ashido spluttered, then turned to the others for help, but received none. After all the teasing she'd inflicted, she was on her own. Sure, great. Todoroki stood up. It's in ten minutes. Meet me in my room then. Ten minutes. Ashido sprang up and ran upstairs. Damn it, Shoto. I just got out of the shower and my hair's still a mess. At least let me change into something nicer if I'm gonna meet your mom. Arg. Midoriya scratched his head. Her hair looked exactly the same to me. Yuraka patted his head. Deku-kun, we girls work very hard to get our hair just right. We know if something is out of place, even if you can't see it. Also, Mina is meeting Shoto's mom, Siro said. Isn't that a big deal for relationships? Hey, when is Achako gonna meet your mom? Izuku. Wait, no, she met both of your parents at I Island. Actually, I already met his mom before then, Yuraka admitted. It was at the hospital when we saved Yuri. She was really nice. Asui nodded. Then I guess Izuku is the one who hasn't met your parents, Ribbit. Maybe you two should get on that, since you've been dating for a while. Neither Midoriya nor Yuraka looked at each other. Er, yeah, we'll do that, Sue, thanks. Ribbit. With her eyes closed, Asui didn't see Siro's eye twitch, but she could imagine it, and it made her smile. Todoroki waited patiently in his room, only occasionally adjusting the tablet on his desk. It wasn't out of anxiety, he just wanted to make sure there was as little glare as possible when his emotionally fragile mother met his overly enthusiastic girlfriend. Okay, so maybe there was a little anxiety. There was a knock at his door. Come in. Did it start yet? Ashido poked her head through the doorway. No, you're fine, Todoroki assured her. But could you wait for me to introduce you? My mom can be a little delicate, especially with new people. Ashido nodded. Todoroki had told the rising stars a little bit about his mother shortly before the training camp and it broke their hearts. Ashido herself had had to hold in tears until she got home, and made a personal vow that she would never forgive Endeavor for what he had done. Todoroki took a moment to look at his girlfriend. You look nice. Thanks. When not in her school uniform, Ashido liked to wear shorts and tight-fitting shirts, usually with loud, exuberant colors that fit her personality. That had been what she'd been wearing before rushing to her room. Now, she had a modest white t-shirt and blue jeans. Todoroki hadn't even known she owned pants. Both of them jumped when Todoroki's tablet rang. He spun in his chair and answered the call. Hi, Fayumi. His sister, an older girl with glasses and white hair speckled with red, smiled. Hey, Shoto. How are you doing? Class is going well. Everything's fine. Is Natsuo there? Yeah, he's just talking to mom while I make sure the connection's good. Is your girlfriend joining us? Shoto glanced to his right, and Ashido grinned at him. Yes, but I wanted to take things slow with mom. Good call. She's been getting better, but there's still the occasional bad day. Anything recent? The last thing Shoto wanted was to see his mother have a breakdown, especially in front of Ashido. Last week, but they gave her some meds to calm her down, and she was fine after a couple of hours. That's good, right? Yeah, it was the first time they'd had to do that in almost three months, and it was over pretty quick. Fayumi gasped. Your girlfriend is in the room, isn't she? Sorry, Ashido-san. I didn't mean to throw all that at you, I'm just not used to Shoto having company. Since Shoto's mother wasn't there yet, Ashido took the opportunity to come into view. She gave Shoto a quick hug and smiled at Fayumi. It's okay, and I promise that nothing I hear will leave this room. Fayumi smiled back. Wow, she's even prettier than you said she was, Shoto. And it seems good looks run in the family, Ashido said with a grin. Shoto closed his eyes and groaned. I'm having so many regrets right now. The two girls laughed for a moment, but then Fayumi paused. Oh, Natsuo is bringing in mom. Ashido gave Shoto a quick kiss and then retreated out of sight. A moment later, a young man with short, spiky white hair brought in one Todoroki Ray. She looked younger than she was, with pale skin and hair the color of freshly fallen snow. She walked slowly to the chair that Fayumi had quickly vacated. Hello, Shoto, she said with a voice so gentle that it made Ishido immediately want to hug her. I'm so glad to see you again. Hi, Mom. Shoto nodded at the screen. Hi, Natsuo. Hey, little brother. The older Todoroki sibling grinned. Before we start, the doctors told me that we can have these little chats once a week, so we can make this a regular thing. 
That's great, Shoto said awkwardly. I'd like that. So would I, Ray said. Now, Shoto, can you tell me what you've been up to? Actually, before we go into that, there's someone I'd like you to meet. If you feel up to it, I mean. Ray tilted her head. I think so. It should be easier than in person. Shoto nodded, and then gestured to Ashido. I'd like you to meet Ashido Mina. Ashido took a moment to take in Ray's appearance, and then bowed. It's so nice to meet you, Todoroki-san. Ray smiled. Please, call me Ray. So, you're my son's girlfriend. If his last few letters are any indication, you make him quite happy, though he didn't do your beauty justice. Those horns are quite lovely, Ashido-san. Behind their mother, Fayumi and Natsuo muffled their laughter, while Shoto resisted the urge to bang his head on the desk. For her part, Ashido grinned and slipped her hand into Shoto's. Thank you. They make hats a challenge, though. And you can call me Mina, if that's okay. Rei turned her attention to her youngest. I like her. Shoto smiled. So do I. Hey, Shoto. Fayumi leaned over her mother's shoulder. Didn't you guys have a big exam today? How did you do? We had our tests to get our provisional licenses. Shoto pulled out his wallet and showed them his license. I passed. Ashido took out her own license. So did I. Only one person in our class didn't, and he can take a makeup exam. Ray's eyes lit up. That's wonderful. I'm so proud of you both. Can you tell me more? Shoto put his license down, then slipped his hand below the camera so that he could take Ashido's free hand. I'd like that. The next day, Aizawa walked into class with even more of a slouch than usual, and the students had gotten to know him well enough to realize that meant one of two things. Either he had had a busy night on patrol, because he had his hero duties on top of being a teacher, or he had been working on something that had to do with them. Today, you won't be training during heroics, he said, to the muffled groan of the class. Instead, all of you with provisional licenses will be making contact with heroes for work-study programs. Most of the class was stumped, but Midoriya, Ida and Yeirazu perked up in interest. Bakugo, on the other hand, scowled and leaned back in his seat. Work studies are like internships, only much more intense, Aizawa explained. You'll be learning from pro heroes, but you'll be expected to work in the field. This will also go on for an entire month, and you'll be expected to keep up with your classes in the meantime. As such, if you think you can handle it, you can apply. But it will look much worse if you try and fail than if you wait and build yourself up for next year. The hero community will look on you more favorably if you're being honest with yourself. The students in the bottom half of the class looked uncertain, especially Ishido. She had been steadily improving her grades but she was still at the bottom among her friends. However, if you make it through the entire month, you'll receive appropriate financial compensation. Essentially, you'll be temporary sidekicks and will be treated as such. That had Uraraka's attention more than anyone else. Furthermore, you will not be scouted by hero agencies. Instead, you will reach out to any resource you've made since the sports festival and apply for a work study. Any agency you apply to has the right to refuse, and most do, since there's a higher possibility of you going into dangerous situations. So if you don't have many connections, your chances aren't good. I'll give you the rest of class to think about it. Aizawa then pulled out his sleeping bag. Don't make too much noise. As soon as Aizawa was asleep, the rising stars grouped up around Midoriya's desk. Should I even try for a work study? Ashido asked. I mean, Midori, Momo, Shoto and Tenya, you guys have the best grades, so I'm guessing you'll be doing it. Midoriya nodded. Aizawa-sensei said to utilize the connections we've made. I wonder if I can talk to Hawks. I fully intend to speak to my brother about a work study under him. Ida said proudly. Endeavor will probably insist I go with his agency. Todoroki sighed. He'll just tell me to watch as he does all the work. Yeyarazu bit her lip. The idea of a work study sounds challenging, but also exciting. I'll place a call to Ruku and see if she would be willing to take me on again. The other half of the rising stars looked uncertain. The opportunities the work study offered were huge, but so was the risk to their future careers. Eventually, they reached a conclusion the same way many teenagers did. Their friends were doing it, so they would as well. Maybe Gunhead and Selkie will take us on again, Yuraraka said to Asui. That would be nice, Ribbit. Asui shrugged. What about you, Hanta? Honestly, I don't know if I made that big of an impression with Air Jet, Siro admitted, then turned to Ida. Were you serious about your brother letting us work with him? Ida nodded. I will speak to him later and ask on your behalf. Cool, thanks. Ashido sighed. I guess that leaves me. Man, I really hope Sky Dancer does work studies, or I'm gonna have to sit this out. Yeyurazu smiled sympathetically. 
Remember, the worst that can happen at this point is that they say no, and we still have a good chance next year. All we have to do is ask. Sorry, kid, I'm gonna have to say no. Midoriya winced at Hawk's words. Are really? I can seriously picture you looking all sad right now. Hawk sighed. Look, don't get me wrong. On any other day, I'd say yes in a heartbeat. Hell, I'll definitely take you on for another internship and a work study next year, but I'm... I'm on a sensitive assignment right now. I can't do this job and worry about you at the same time. I understand, Midoriya said, though he couldn't hide his disappointment. Hey, you think you have it rough? I have to tell Yuki that I turned you down, and she'll read me the riot act for a week. Ox chuckled. By the way, I need to apologize. That threw Midoriya for a loop. F for what? I should have checked in on you before now. I wish I'd done more to help after you got kidnapped. But I kept going to the wrong place at the wrong time. Maybe it was Midoriya's imagination, but while Hawks sounded genuine, his words felt scripted, like he wasn't saying what he really wanted to. Still, he appreciated that someone like Hawks cared enough to say something at all. It's okay, he said. I'm okay, mostly. Yeah, I saw your provisional license picture on the Hero Network. Did your eyes get cool powers, or do they just make you look like you're related to that pink classmate of yours? Everyone thinks we're twins now, Midoriya complained, even though he really didn't mind. Hawks laughed. Anyway, sorry again for not taking you on for a work study. If you have any friends who are going, maybe try asking them to see if their mentors have another spot. Sorry, gotta go, kid, good luck out there. Midoriya stared at his phone for a long moment after Hawks hung up. The number three hero had been his best hope for a work study, but now he was back to square one. He supposed he could ask Ida or Todoroki if their work studies had any open spots, but Siro had already asked the former, and the idea of working for Endeavor made Midoriya uncomfortable. Hey, freshman. A strong hand slapped his back, and he nearly stumbled headfirst into a wall. Whoops. Sorry. Midoriya took a moment to slow his racing heartbeat, and then turned to Tagata. H. Hi, Mirio. What are you doing here? Tagata shrugged. My class ended early, so I thought I'd see how you were doing. What's up? Midoriya sighed. We're trying to sign up for work studies, but Hawks was too busy and I don't know if I have any other options. Wait, you're looking for a work study already. Tagata grinned. You're really going for broke, huh? Hey, what if I put in a good word with Sir Nighteye? Midoriya slowly blinked. You know Sir Nighteye? Yes. Tagata tilted his head. Did I never mention that before? No. Midoriya grabbed the older boy by the arms and shook him. You know All Might's former psychic. How? He's my mentor. Tagata activated permeation in his arms to slip free. I had my first internship with him, and he's been my mentor ever since. He'll probably want to test you, but I bet he'll love to have you on the team. Midoriya couldn't believe his luck, his issues with All Might aside. Sir Nighteye had a reputation for efficiency and discipline, even back when he was a psychic. His agency was also very active, which meant that not only would Midoriya be able to get some real experience, he would also be able to do some good. Thank you, Mirio. Tagata waved him off. No problem, Izuku. He looked over his shoulder and grinned. Looks like you're not the only one getting offers today. Midoriya followed his gaze and saw Yuraraka and Asui talking to Hado. He was too far away to hear. But whatever the older girl said made the other two smile and hug her. Is she going to introduce them to Rukyu? He asked. Yeah, Nejire was going on about how Ryukyu wanted more interns, and Momo told her that those two couldn't get in touch with the last agencies they worked for. Midoriya sighed in relief, he had been worried that no one would be willing to take on some of the lower-ranked students for work studies. Since you don't have to worry about this anymore, Tagata went on, mind helping me with Black Whip. It's still a handful, sure. After what Tagata had just done for him, Midoriya was more than eager to help. What do you want to work on? Tagata grinned. I kinda want to see how strong it is. Mind turning into something with muscles. On the other side of the room, Hado put hand over her mouth to keep from laughing. Yuraraka and Asui were confused, until they followed her pointing finger. They then saw Human Gaussor hurl Tagata into the air, and only stopped because the latter had Black Whip attached to the former's arm. Do we want to know, Ribbit? Asui asked. Probably not, Yuraraka said as she watched the boys reenact a fish on a line. But maybe we should get snacks, because this is funny. Shigaraki had elected not to bring the entire league for the meeting, officially. He had only twice, Magni and Chimera standing behind him. Of course, he wasn't stupid enough to take chances, and had Toga, Mr. Compress and Slice waiting in the shadows. And a signal from any of them could summon the rest of the league via Kirajiri's portals. The only one absent was Nine. He had burnt out his latest regeneration quirk, and the doctor was busy implanting a new one while he searched for a permanent match. Personally, Shigaraki hoped that search never ended, 
because it kept Nine dependent on the doctor, and through him, Shigaraki. It might have been breaking the terms of the meeting, but Shigaraki would bet his left arm that the other side of the meeting had taken similar security precautions. In fact, he would be disappointed otherwise. Chisaki Kai was, for the most part, fairly unimpressive. He wore casual pants and a green jacket, and his features would have been unremarkable, save for the beak-like mask over his face. Shigaraki wasn't sure if there was some avian theme going on, but all of Chisaki's men had similar masks, though theirs had goggles to go with them. They also wore long coats and hoods to conceal any weapons, quirks, or identifying features. Shigaraki wanted to roll his eyes. If you wanted to be inconspicuous, don't wear outfits that practically announce that you are hiding something. He could go unnoticed with just a hoodie and casual demeanor. Thank you for attending this meeting in person, Chisaki said, his voice calm and collected. Though I can't be sure if you're a clone or not. Shigaraki decided that that had been a poor attempt at a joke, and not an insult. Well, I don't plan on breaking my arm to prove I'm the real deal. Chisaki didn't bat an eye. Fair enough. What does the League of Villains want with the eight precepts of death? Shigaraki wanted to sneer. He probably could have gotten away with it if he was careful, but that defeated the purpose of a sneer. Eight precepts of death sounded like these Yakuza were either trying too hard to sound dangerous, or there was some stupid historical or philosophical meaning behind the name. Either way, it sounded stupid to him. I think there's a mutual benefit to a partnership, Shigaraki said. Your organization has money and connections, mine has power and prestige. I don't need to spell out how we can both benefit. Chisaki slowly leaned back in his chair. Both leaders had brought seating arrangements from their respective hideouts. But while Shigaraki brought in a battered armchair, Chisaki had a carved oak throne. You really don't offer much. Excuse me. True, your league has some powerful fighters, but prestige. You've been on the run since All Might defeated All for One. You haven't done anything to earn prestige, other than an association with Stain, who was captured, and a failed attack on a school full of children. You don't have a plan, just some half-baked ideals. Chisaki raised an eyebrow. You would be better served to join my cause. Shigaraki's first instinct was to be furious at such a brazen declaration. Yes, the League had suffered some setbacks, but even after everything, they were still intact. In fact, with twice his sanity restored, their power had only grown. After a moment, Shigaraki composed himself. He would not lose control in front of a Yakuza punk. And do you have a plan? Of course I do. Shigaraki scoffed. Well, enlighten us. Maybe we can come to an agreement if I know you're not all talk. Chisaki slowly rose to his feet. The League of Villains tensed, but the Yakuza only stared up at the ceiling. The Yakuza's power has always shifted. Sometimes, we were kings in all but name, while in others, we were barely more than common gangsters. But one thing that remained constant was that we survived, we wouldn't die out, and that gave us the chance to grow strong again. All that changed with the advent of Quirks. The way Chisaki said that last word made it sound like a curse. Suddenly, law enforcement agents not only had the courage to stand against us, they had abilities no normal human should have had. In two generations, we were all but extinct. Is there a point to this history lesson? Shigaraki asked. Chisaki glared at him. My plan is to level the playing field. I have the resources necessary to make heroes obsolete, save for one thing. That's what I need the League for. You bring me what I need, and I'll make sure you have a seat at the table. Now it was Shigaraki's turn to rise. You don't know me very well, do you? I don't want to be a bit player under someone else, and I don't care about resurrecting a bunch of nobodies. I want to rule, and to hell with anyone who tries to stop me. All of the Yakuza, minus Chisaki himself, oddly enough, bristled at the insult, especially the one who looked more like a tiny puppet than a person. Watch your mouth, punk, the little guy said with a high-pitched voice that suddenly deepened. Nobody insults the eight precepts like that. You're not the only one who doesn't like being insulted. Magni stepped forward. I joined the League of Villains of my own free will, and I'm not about to hand myself over to a bunch of lowlife gangsters. Before Shigaraki could stop her, Magni aimed one of her new gauntlets at Chisaki. They were a poor substitute for the enormous magnet she'd used, but they got the job done. Chisaki flew towards her, and all hell broke loose. Shigaraki was closest, and his hand reached out for Chisaki. Shield. The Yakuza boss snapped, and one of the foot soldiers placed himself in front of Shigaraki. The man screamed as his head disintegrated, but he refused to budge. Magni landed a devastating punch on Chisaki's face, and the tide seemed to turn in the League's favor as Kurajiri warped in the backup unit. Shigaraki felt confident, even as more Yakuza burst in. Then Chisaki put his hand on Magna's chest. One second, Magni had been completely fine. The next, her entire upper half exploded in a wash of blood. 
Her legs trembled, then flopped to the floor. The League froze at the sight of their comrade so easily and mercilessly killed, and the Yakuza, seeing that their master was no longer being attacked, paused as well. Blood so disgusting Chisaki stumbled backwards, then composed himself. I suggest we take a break and meet after tempers have cooled down. You think we're just going to let you leave? Twice looked apoplectic, even with his mask on. You just killed Magni, and your leader just killed one of mine, which makes us even. Chisaki walked to the door. I'll send you the time and place. Just you and me, though, we can hash out the details of what I need then. Shigaraki said nothing, and waited until the Yakuza were gone before turning to the League. Head back to the hideout. Are you kidding, Shigaraki? Twice grabbed him by the shirt. You're just gonna act like nothing's happened. Of course not. Shigaraki pushed the other man away, then noticed something out of the corner of his eye. A glint in the dead Yakuza soldier's coat. What's this? Shigaraki pulled a gun out from the man's pocket. He wasn't an expert on firearms, but he'd played enough shooters to know when a weapon had been modified. He removed the bullets and found that they weren't bullets at all. Instead, they looked like a needle attached to a red cartridge of some kind. Shigaraki suspected that it had something to do with Chisaki's nebulous plan. Kirajiri, get these to the doctor and tell him I need to know what they do. This now has top priority. The rest of us are going back, I need to think. This wasn't over, Shigaraki swore, not by a long shot. Aizawa leaned back in his chair and sipped his coffee like it was the last cup he'd ever have. His students gave him enough sleepless nights on a good day, but now it felt like they were trying to get revenge for something. Almost half of class when I had applied for work studies, and to his surprise, all had been accepted. Yeyorazu, Yuraraka and Asui had all been taken under Ruku's wing, while Ida and Siro were working under Ingenium. Ashido had talked to Sky Dancer and was working for her again, while Todoroki was back with Endeavor. In hindsight, none of those choices had surprised Aizawa, save for Midoriya. Somehow, he'd ended up interning with a hero Aizawa would have kept his student away from. He didn't necessarily dislike Sir Nighteye. On the contrary, the man's logical approach to cases and his rationalization of ideals struck a chord with Aizawa. However, he knew that Nighteye had been spying on Midoriya, and that bothered him. From what Nezu had told him, Night Eye didn't have the same hang-ups about Midoriya that All Might did, whatever they were, and the little rodent wouldn't say. However, he seemed particularly protective of Togata, so anyone he hadn't thoroughly interviewed raised red flags with the man. Aizawa sighed. The only one of the work-study students that wasn't giving him a headache by associating with Midoriya was Kirishima. The boy had somehow bullet Amajiki into introducing him to his mentor, Fat Gum, and had been approved for a work-study. That wouldn't cause problems. Fat Gum was a street-level hero, rarely dealing with villains more dangerous than common criminals. Between him and Amajiki, Kirishima would be safe. Hey, Eraser. Present Mike slapped his friend's back, and Aizawa scrambled to save his precious coffee. How's the paperwork for the work-study kids? Aizawa gave him a withering glare, then pointed at the stack of papers on his desk. Present Mike whistled. That's for all nine of them. No, that's for one of them, Aizawa growled. Ever since the students moved into the dorms, paperwork for security and liabilities have quadrupled. Dear God, present Mike turned on his heel. Well, good luck with that, buddy. Not so fast, Aizawa said, catching his old friend with his binding cloth. These all need two signatures by tomorrow morning, and you just volunteered. See, this is why I think Ms. Joke is completely insane, because she wants to spend time with you outside of work. So, what's Sir Knight I like? Midoriya asked as he and Tagata got out of the taxi. They had been talking about other things during their trip, but it had taken until now for Midoriya to work up the courage to ask about his mentor. Togata laughed. Well, he's strict, but he also likes humor. If you can make him smile, you're golden. Oh, and I think he knows almost as much hero trivia as you do, so if you get on his good side, you'll have a ball. W well, I don't know if I can be funny, but I'll do my best. That's the spirit. Togata opened the door to the agency, which looked more like an office building. Sir doesn't have many psychics, but they're all good at what they do, feel free to ask them anything. Tagata led him to another door and opened it. Sir, I brought Midoriya and, oh, whoops, sorry, I didn't know you were inflicting tickle hell. The sheer randomness of that sentence made Midoriya look around Tagata and into the office. There, surrounded by All Might merchandise lining the walls, he saw a woman with blue skin and a high-cut top strapped into what looked like a space-age rack while a man in a suit glared at her. Instead of being torn apart, the woman appeared to be getting tickled mercilessly and was gasping for breath. It's fine, Mirio, the man said, and pressed a button. The woman fell out of the machine with a whimper. I hope that you do better for your next assignment, Bubble Girl. 
Absolutely, sir. The woman shakily got to her feet and staggered out of the office. Come inside, Sir Knight I said, and waited for Tagata to close the door before turning to Midoriya. I assume you're wondering what that was about. I don't think I'm old enough to know what that was about. Knight I raised an eyebrow. The attempt at humor is noted, but not very effective. I give you a 5 out of 10. Better than my first try, Tagata stage whispered. I got a 3. You told a knock-knock joke. A 3 was the best you were going to get. Knight I adjusted his tie. I enforce discipline and punish failure through my version of corporal punishment. Isn't that illegal? Midoriya asked. Corporal punishment is described as inflicting physical pain. Night I said blandly. Tickling does not fall under that definition. If anything, stimulating the pleasure centers of the brain is actually considered a reward by law. Midoriya was now seriously reconsidering working for a man who was technically rewarded for torturing his employees. Now then, Midoriya Izuku, the towering, lanky man looked down at the student. Why did you apply for a work study under me? That had been something Midoriya had been thinking about for a while, and once he'd gotten over his panic, he'd come to an answer. Because you were the psychic to the number one hero, he said. If anyone would have insights on how to become a successful pro, it would be you. Night I didn't move. And why wouldn't you apply to work for Endeavor? He is currently the top hero, after all. Midoriya didn't like the idea of working under a man who had driven his wife to a mental breakdown and disfiguring his friend. I don't think he would be a good fit for me. If Night I had any idea about what Midoriya knew of Endeavor, he didn't show any sign. Indeed. And you think that my association with All Might will provide you with the insight you need to be the best. I don't care about being the best. Midoriya was surprised to find that he meant it. All I care about is doing what I can to help people. The only reason I'd want to be the top hero is because the higher ranked you are, the larger your jurisdiction. And therefore, the more people you can help. Night I blinked. A surprising rationalization for an idealistic mindset. He glanced at the older student. Nerio, please leave us. I want to test this boy before I decide if I will accept him or not. Kagata saluted. You got it, sir. Good luck, freshman, you're gonna need it. Night I waited until the older student left and then gave Midoriya a piercing glare. Midoriya Izuku, how much did Mirio tell you about one for all? For a moment, Midoriya panicked, but then realized that if All Might was going to tell anyone about his quirk, the man who used to be one of his closest friends would be near the top of the list. Nidai was probably testing him, trying to see if he could be trusted. Midoriya tried not to take it personally. Um, can I ask how you know if he told me anything? Naitai raised an eyebrow. I have staked much of Japan's future on Mirio, considering what you have been through in this year alone. It would be prudent of me to be aware of all your dealings with him. That wasn't completely unfair. As far as I know, he's told me everything, Midoriya admitted. I've been helping him control Black Whip since it awakened. Yes, such a phenomenon has never happened to a user of One for All before. If Mirio gains all the quirks of the past users, he could be one of the greatest heroes in history. Night I sighed, assuming he can master them all. He has informed me of his struggles with Black Whip. Midoriya felt the need to defend Tagata there. He's been getting better when we were sparring. It only took him two seconds to get Black Whip to let go without cutting his quirk entirely. Indeed, that was better than the four seconds it took last week. Night I adjusted his glasses. I track his progress as thoroughly as you do, Midoriya-san. Midoriya didn't know what to say about that, and settled for looking around the office, specifically, at the many pieces of vintage All Might merchandise lining the walls and shelves. Even if his opinion of All Might was lower, he could appreciate the rarer items Night Eye had acquired. Tell me something, Midoriya-san, what do you expect to do while working under me? Um, I guess I would be training, maybe helping you on patrols, even though you aren't known for street-level operations like that and prefer to search for crime, rather than wait for it to happen, and generally learning from you. If Night Eye felt anything about Midoriya suddenly mumbling mid-sentence, he didn't show it. That is correct. For the most part, I will leave physical training to Mirio, you two work well together, and I see no reason to stop that. I will also send you two out to investigate certain areas regarding an investigation I am leading. However, your tasks will be to observe and report only. If you encounter a criminal, you will only stop them if your life or the life of someone else is in danger. You will think and consider every action before making it. I want your solemn vow that you will follow that order before I even begin to consider accepting you into my agency. Considering the last time Midoriya had gone off without thinking, he had no problem agreeing to those terms. I understand, and I promise. Good. Night I held out a piece of paper and a rubber seal. Each work-study student will have a different schedule. 
I expect you to be here for three hours every day after school during the weekdays. During the weekends, you will be here from six in the morning and will only leave when I say so. In addition, I have the authority to call you here at any point if there is an emergency. That includes pulling you out of class. Can you handle that kind of work? To his credit, Midoriya considered the man's words. It would be exhausting, but if he really wanted to be a pro hero, he would be working far longer hours. I can, and I will. Good answer. Now, one more thing. Nighteye placed his hand on Midoriya's shoulder and looked him in the eye. I want to test your abilities, observing you can only get me so much information, and I need to know what you are capable of in the field. You and I are going to spar, here, in my office. Your goal is to take this seal, he held up the stamp for emphasis, from me, and press it against your permission form. If you do that, or prevent me from escaping in three minutes, I will have you as a work-study student for as long as you wish. This includes the rest of your time at UA as well. Midoriya saw Nighteye's eyes glow as he stepped back. You just used your quirk on me. I did. Nighteye held up his watch. Your time starts now. Midoriya didn't hesitate, and in an instant, turned into a blue monkey with four arms and four eyes. With a simian shriek, he lunged for Nighteye's hand. However, the hero had not only moved out of the way, but positioned himself to send Spider Monkey sprawling with a perfectly timed kick. What was that? Spider Monkey wondered. I'm moving faster than any normal human and there was never any record of Sir Nighteye having a quirk that enhances physical abilities. Then again, his quirk was never made public, so it's probably something the government doesn't want getting out. Are you done analyzing? Nighteye turned and headed for the door. It has only been 15 seconds, and you are already knocked down. You are not making a very good first impression, Midoriya. Rather than answer, Spider Monkey flipped his tail to arch over his head, and from the hollow end, fired a net of sticky webbing that covered the door. Now, Nighteye had no way of leaving. Of course, Nighteye had no intention of running away, and surprised Spider Monkey again when he kicked a large book off his desk with enough force to leave a sizable bruise when it connected with Spider Monkey's head. Ouch, I believe I have made my skill abundantly clear, Nighteye said dryly. Well, yeah, Spider Monkey replied. You're a pro hero with years of training and experience. I've been in three real fights in my whole life. To his surprise, Nighteye nodded. That is true. I appreciate that you do not factor in your power in your assessment. It shows maturity and humility. He took a step back an instant before he finished talking, narrowly avoiding the webbing that would have hit his foot. And your willingness to strike while your opponent is speaking shows practicality. Spider Monkey jumped to avoid another book that Night Eye hurled, only to fall to the ground when the man used the distraction of the projectile to run up and kick him in the head. How does he know exactly what to do, and when to do it? He's so calm, it's like he knows what's so. oh. I think I figured out your quirk, he said through clenched teeth. Night I paused. Do tell. I've got it narrowed down to two options. You can either read my mind, or you can see the future. Either way, the result's the same. You know what I'm going to do before I do it. Spider Monkey stepped away, then reverted back to normal. I had no chance of winning. Technically, you did. But it would have involved destroying a good portion of my building. Night I admitted. Of course, I didn't foresee you doing that, so I was not worried. And, yes, my quirk lets me see the future of an individual, as long as I am physically touching them and making eye contact. I can also only use it once per day. Night Eye's only reaction to Midoriya pulling out a notebook was a raised eyebrow. Even with those limitations, it must make you extremely effective against individuals, and not just in combat. You would be able to track their movements without ever needing to put yourself in danger more than once, and... I am well aware of my quirk's potential and limitations, Night I interrupted. Just as I am aware of yours, while the recharge time for your watch is only a few minutes at most, you are still vulnerable during that time. During your work study, your training will involve sharpening your skills in your normal state. Mirio will handle that. Midoriya let that sink in for a moment. Does that mean that you'll let me work for you? But I didn't stop you or take the seal. That is true, but you impressed me with your deduction of my quirk. Very few people ever figure it out. Night I adjusted his glasses, and Mirio has been practically begging me to take you on for weeks. If I say no now, I will have to deal with him moping, and that is not worth the extra work you will make me do. Midoriya grinned, ignoring the pain from his bruises. Thank you so much. I won't let you down. I should hope not, Night I said gravely. The case you will be assisting me with cannot afford failure. I do not exaggerate when I say that lives could hang in the balance. For the first time, Midoriya truly wondered what he was getting himself into. So alright folks that's all for today. Stay tuned for part 12. Do subscribe, like and share for more such videos. Also check out the story and author the incredible muffin on finfiction.net.
press the bell icon to be notified first on release. See you in the next video till then goodbye.